All right, it is officially five o'clock and we are starting the meeting on time tonight, which normally we're starting at 4.30 anyway, but we don't get out here to get everybody in, uh, joined in until sometimes later than that. So welcome everybody to uh, tonight's uh, city council meeting. It is October 26th and it is five o'clock and we are here to have a city council meeting. Um, if you could uh, all uh, rise and, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good to see you back, Ms. O'Connell. Welcome. Um, a roll call, please. Council Member Borelli? Here. Council Member No? Here. Council Member Saragossa? Here. Vice Mayor Taylor? Here. Mayor Thomas? Here. All right. All right. Can we keep the ducks down out there, please? All right. So to, at this particular time, um, one of the, one of the, um, what I consider the benefit of being the mayor is I get to recognize and acknowledge uh, different people and different organizations in our community at different times for a variety of different reasons. And tonight, it happens to be the extra mile day in the city of Placerville. And, and I get the honor of, uh, one, reading this proclamation and acknowledging a few people in our community that, that have gone the extra mile. And so I'm going to go ahead and read the proclamation first. A proclamation of the City Council of the City of Placerville declaring November 1, 2021, an extra mile day in the City of Placerville. The City of Placerville is a community which acknowledges that's, that a special vibrancy exists within the entire community when, it, when its individual citizens collectively go the extra mile in personal effort, volunteerism, and service. And whereas the city of Placerville is a community which encourages its citizens to maximize their personal contribution to the community by giving of themselves wholeheartedly and with total effort, commitment, and conviction to their individual ambitions, family, friends, and community. And whereas the city of Placerville is a community which chooses to shine a light on the cel and celebrate individuals and organizations within its community who go the extra mile in order to make a difference and lift up fellow members of their community. And the City of Placerville acknowledges the mission of Extra Mile America to create 550 Extra Mile cities in America and is proud to support Extra Mile Day on November 1, 2021. Now, therefore, I, Dennis Thomas, Mayor of the City of Placerville, do hereby proclaim November 1, 2021 by to be Extra Mile Day. I urge each individual in the community to take time on this day to not only go the extra mile in his or her own life, but to also acknowledge all of those who are inspirational in their efforts and commitment to make their organizations, families, community, country, a world and world a better place. Now, uh, as, as a city, I, I, I disagree with them a little bit. I don't think we need to encourage. I think we have this in our community. I think we have so many people in our community that, that go the extra mile, that support, that encourage, that lift. And tonight I chose to focus on the youth in our community and for this, for this particular recognition because there's so many different ways to go. I truly believe that some of these young children could be lost if not for the efforts of these folks that I'm going to acknowledge tonight. And all of those... Um, they inspire so many people to participate. I also believe that their efforts have allowed many children to explore their potentials in ways that would otherwise not been given to them. They have given so many people the opportunity to give to worthy causes, and our community is far better for having them here. Just to be clear, I know, I know your types, the two of you out there that I'm talking about, and you will want to say it's everybody else. We have a team behind us. We, we, if it weren't for all these other people, it wouldn't be them. But tonight, I'm recognizing your recognition and your efforts in our community. In particular, uh, Jennifer Bassett uh, is from Hands for Hope. And I first learned of Jennifer during, a, during Wendy's last term on city council. And uh, 
Wendy said, you have to meet Jennifer. We need to go to this fundraiser. You, we have to. I said, what's the, it's in the Eldorado Hills. Why are we going to an Eldorado Hills? This is Placerville, right? She goes, you got to meet her. So I said, fine. So we ended up in Eldorado Hills at a fundraiser, and I met Jennifer. And her enthusiasm and her spirit that was about her was um, infectious. And it was obvious by all the people that followed her and acknowledged her and by the energy that was generated at down at Eldorado Hills and supporting the youth down there. And when I saw that and I heard that she wanted to bring that to Placerville, it was, um, it was very meaningful that you would bring that effort to our community to support the children in our town. And a long story short, uh, you opened up a new new location on Spring Street, and we all, many of us, got to go to that uh, to that grand opening and to see the, the the teenagers that you that you have inspired to step up into leadership roles to to reach out in the community and do things that they otherwise might not have done without your effort and the people that you inspire to support the program that you that you have such a heart for. As for these reasons that I will enter your name as a person that has gone has given selflessly to our community. So thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. And I'll, I got one more, and then if, you, if you'd like to speak for a second, I, we would love that. Gordon Vecini. What can you say about Gordon? Um, you have been around a long time, and there are many people that love our community and have served in so many different ways and support our town. Gordon has been doing this a long time longer than I can remember, and it's probably way before, before my time you've been doing this. Um, his passion for our children has been constant. His passion for the Boys and Girls Clubs has helped build a legacy, not for him, but for his generation. My kids went there. My grandkids have gone there. And it has been a place, a meaningful place for the youth in our community that don't have places to go, that may not have breakfasts, that gets support, that gets the support from your effort. Sorry. His passion for our country is contagious. His army of volunteers know when Gorin calls, it's a worthy cause. And they can't imagine ever saying no. And so for that, I find I also am going to enter your name into our into this national registry for people that have gone the extra mile. And so along with that, I didn't expect to get so choked up. Along with that, <clears throat> you guys get the Mayor's Cup. I know there's a limited number of these. I didn't sign them. I probably should do that. It's the Mayor's Cup for the positive light that you shine on our community. And this is for both of you. And I appreciate everything you do for our community. So, um, Jennifer, if you'd like to say a, a, a short few words. Ever come up to the podium? Oh, yeah, you need to come up and speak. Okay. Even if it's a short few words. I just wanted, wanted to say that I'm beyond honored. I would never expect this. I got the email from you, um, and it is such a joy to work with the youth in our community. Our, um, our future is in good hands. I know sometimes it's questionable at times, but it truly is, and just spending some time with these kids um, will show you that. Um, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for all the support from the community in making the Placerville Youth Center happen. Um, and we couldn't have done it without everybody. So we are so grateful, and I am so grateful and yeah. honored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and you didn't have to ask me twice to come up here and speak because. Uh, 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 Watch out when you get a microphone. Yeah, huh? I, I'll, I'll probably get, be getting this from Patty. If this is what uh, Carl. I, I, I can't. Cut it off, Vecini. You're talking way too long. Well, speaking of the, the youth of El Dorado County and Placerville, uh, we've tried this, and Patty knows, and uh, from years past, we tried three different times to have a, a program after school for uh, basically uh, 
a community center or a youth center, and it never, never, never went anywhere until uh, Vicki Barber, Dr. Vicki Barber of the Office of Education, came up with the idea of uh, let's go national with Boys and Girls Club because some kids just don't want to stay in school after they've been uh, disciplined all day and have the same teacher or or whatever, uh, tell them that uh, they're supposed to have a good time after school. So uh, it became uh, something that was a passion, and uh, we finally got it going with the help of a lot of people, and that was 24 years ago. And uh, and now we have, uh, thanks to a, or a community that uh, really stepped up, we were at the Armory for a long time, and uh, we finally got that, and that was, uh, again, uh, it took us four years to get a lease with uh, the National Guard and any time. Uh, you do anything with the government agency, I don't have to speak to people because you are the government agency. And four years, it seemed like it went by in uh, you know, 20 years to help these kids, but we got it. And uh, then our goal was to build a building, and we did. Uh, uh, that was, I need to leave? No, no, you're long? good. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought you were <laughs> cutting. I'll wait when Patty gives me this. I didn't I'm know it was that easy. Down. So anyhow, we uh, thanks to a uh, generous community, and uh, the we got a building built over there, a $3.5 million building at the cost of $0 any taxpayers. And thanks to the city council giving us variances for road improvements, temp fees, and all that stuff, it made it all work. And it, it would have never happened without the whole community, and, uh, and particularly uh, some other people that were very prominent, uh, a couple. I'm not going to mention their names because if I do, he's going to find me, and it's going to cost me a lot of money <laughs> to mention his name, but uh, we know the names on the building over there. Uh, but it takes a community, and uh, this is our future. It's our kids. And if, uh, if you can't give back to your kids, uh, you, you, you're, you're, you're hurting somewhere because we were all kids at one time. And to lose that uh, youth and not be able to do what you want to do and be home alone, and I don't have to tell um, our, our chief of police here, uh, that's when most of the, or most of the uh, crimes start when kids are home alone. They don't have anything to do. They need a place to go, and uh, the Boys and Girls Club has provided that, and uh, I couldn't be any prouder than being a founder of that organization. But uh, that's not uh, – I thought I was coming up here to talk about uh, another little uh, event. I kind of tricked you a little bit there. A little I? bit. So I'm only going to take a minute, but uh, I'm sure everybody's heard about it. Uh, we're doing a pasta feed, and this is uh, talk about uh, how things can change and go south so quick in the community. Uh, this is the Grizzly Flat. Uh, I've seen, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the flyers. I brought some more. We're having a pasta feed uh, uh, this uh, Thursday at the fairgrounds. Uh, our goal is, we are, it's not a goal, it's, 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 we're going to do it. We're going to build a community center out there. I've talked to several of the people that still live there. There's 170 homes that are still there. 490 are gone. Uh, you've seen the flyer. The, the flyer just shows the, the, what's on the flyer is the church, and all that's left there is, uh, you know, a few metal chairs. School's gone. Uh, but they need something to come home to, and they need it now. So we're going to be going to uh, uh, our kickoff is uh, uh, tomorrow or Thursday night at the fairgrounds. It's a pasta feed. It's all donation. Uh, you don't have to show up with a penny. Just show up with your heart and, and give us some support. Uh, I've got 3,000 pounds of pasta, and what I don't serve, I'm going to bring back here next Tuesday. <laughs> and uh, so, just uh, so I'd advise you to uh, get a flyer and uh, uh, make sure that you can make it. And uh, Thank you for being uh, so uh, generous as a city, and uh, uh, if we, we couldn't get by without everybody doing their uh, two cents worth. So, and I appreciate this, and it's not for me. It's uh, I've got a, a, a great family, and a lot of them are right up there. So, <laughs> I was brought up the right way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Patty has had a, a, a <laughs> lifelong relationship with Gordon, and uh, and and I and I called her especially to to say a few words and share just a, a brief moment of her life with Gordon because it's it's significant. It is significant, and it's hard to be brief. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was just thinking, Gordon, um, when I, when we first Gordon, I, I'll I'll go back. Okay, <laughs> Gordon Bassini. Carl Borelli, my late husband, and Ozzie Scariot, who used to um, be in partners and own the the refuge camp, uh, the garbage, <laughs> call it the garbage company. Anyway, they designated themselves as the three Italians. And we got a reputation, the three Italians. And Ozzie um, pretty much uh, started... Um, 
asking us uh, because he employed a lot of the Moore community at his at the out at the garbage company. And so one day he came to Carl and Gordon and he said, "You know, those ki- we call them kids. Those kids uh, are constantly." Um, we have things, we have a, uh, social things for them, but they don't have anything on their own. So what do you guys think about, could we get, would you help me give them a special party? And what I was, what I was thinking about is this is where we had our first special party for the more kids. I don't know. And, um, so then, um, the three Italians' wives objected to be calling the three Italians, so they added and wives. And then, <laughs> because we ended up doing a lot of the work. So then, um, but we kept, as you said, and Gordon said, took a lot of um, uh, friends and family, and so the friends and family objected and said, hey, what about us? So it became known as the three Italians and their families and friends that we did a lot of, of community work for. And um, the the Moore party was just the beginning. And we did a lot to raise funds for CASA, which, again, mm-hmm. helping the kids. And we did a lot to, um, you know, just different community. When anybody needed something, they would call the three Italians. And so we did a lot of, a lot of chicken dinners. <laughs> So, but Gordon is just absolutely the salt of the earth, just a wonderful, wonderful guy, and and to me, he is family, and uh, I just am so appreciative to all that he's done for me, my family, and for the community. So, congratulations, my friend. And as a right on cue, they both have to take off to events that they are working on and supporting. So um, thank you for coming, and uh, have a good evening. We'll see you Thursday night, Gordon. Yes. <laughs> Once again, he asked me for to pitch in and help serve, so I'll be there. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> now that I'm done being choked up. Me too. <laughs> uh, we had no, well, so a closed session report. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. We did not have closed session today. It was canceled, so there's nothing to report. All right. If anybody showed up here for a closed session at 4.30, I apologize that we didn't have it, but were you here? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Somebody was here. Thank you. Um, moving on, adoption of agenda. Could get a motion unless anybody would like to change. So moved. Second. All right, roll call. Uh, nope. Just a oral vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nope. All right, moving on. Um, announcements and presentations to the public. I'll start down here with uh, Council Member No. Um, on the <clears throat> 14th, I went to Goldbug Park. They had the unveiling of the plaque for Pat, uh, Pat Cook and the founders. So that was a. Uh, fun, neat event. I won't say too much because I know that other people always have lots to say. (laughs) And uh, on the 16th, um, Save the Graves at the uh, Union Cemetery. That was a great event. Had a really good turnout. Um, Neat. I hope they do that again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, Sam, I'm sorry I missed the Goldbug event. Uh, I was really bummed. I was stuck down in Sacramento. Uh, but glad that it it was it was great to see that that event go off, and we were able to support a little bit of that uh, last year. But um, I was really bummed I missed that one, and I was also uh, with Jackie and saw uh, uh, Patty there as well at the uh, uh, buried history, and that was a great event. And I really want to thank Andrew for putting that together. Um, it was it was fun. There was a great turnout, um, and. You know, it was, you got a lot of things going on that same day. You had Canal Street shut down for PG and E doing stuff. You had a wedding going on across the street, but it was and nice. Homecoming. To see, and homecoming. And <laughs> homecoming. That's right. So it was nice to see Placerville sort of just you know all, all the energy going around. But it was it was just a great event. And it was it was fun to be there. So thank you. Uh, all right, Patty. 
I guess we all went to the same thing. <laughs> so, cause, and and I, as far as I'm concerned, all were just great. The the plaque dedication, uh, Mark Acuna did a great job, I think, organizing it, and everybody else that was involved, and and our um, David Turch uh, came up from, or he's our lobbyist from, all the way from Washington. He and his wife came, and they were um, they were great supporters, and really uh, were the financial background of this and I, I encourage all of you to when you get a chance drive out to Goldbug and see the the uh, plaque and the rock that was chosen by the Verkamps very carefully and uh, view that and um, I just want to thank everybody that supported the Buried History Day that that was it was a big success we had just so many people and parking was at a minimum, unfortunately, but it's the way things go in Placerville, huh? <laughs> and just and and a lot of children, which was really that was great too for you know learn all about the history. So I just want to thank everybody for supporting that cause. <clears throat> all right, Vice Mayor. All right, Taylor. Um, well, first I just want to give a shout out to our staff that, um, you know, over this stormy weekend, many of them worked overtime to make sure that our storm drains were clear and that um, our infrastructure was keeping up with all of the storm water. And um, I know there was a lot of hard work that went into that. So we, I just want to express my gratitude um, and appreciation for that. We had very little damage that I'm aware of um, in the city. So seems like everything went off really well um, and and that's just should be celebrated um, I also attended the dedication ceremony at Goldbug Park and the buried history preview I took my seven-year-old daughter to that on Friday night and it was a lot of fun learning about Nancy Gooch and Owen Verkamp and Joseph Staples and um, Harley Dillinger and, and so many other great stories um, what a what a fantastic way to celebrate and showcase our history. Um, I got to go to the Hangtown Music Festival on Saturday, which was a lot of fun. My first night out with my husband and no kids in a long time, and I think it's just fun that that exists in Placerville. Um, it's just been great to, you know, the last couple of weeks see so many community events out and people getting out again. Um, and then just some announcements. There is Halloween at Goldbug Park from 10 to 4 on October 31st, and then the Spooktacular is back on after um, an interruption with COVID. So that will be happening as well um, after 4 o'clock on Halloween. That's downtown. Yep, on Main Street. Do they, I thought it was trick-or-treat on Main Street. Yeah, Spooktacular is called. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. I've never I've heard that. <laughs> I thought it was trick-or-treat on Main Street too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I guess they rebranded it. <laughs> <laughs> it's Terry. Did we rebrand that? No, it's Halloween Spooktacular. Is that? Halloween Spooktacular. Oh, I guess that's our nickname for yeah. it always. <laughs> down to go. I, don't know what. I need to keep up here. Sorry about that. Um, I, um, it's, been a, it's been a busy last couple of weeks. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I did is I went to Eschaton. They invited me to go up there and speak to all of their members. And, um, and it was... Uh, it was I, and it was really nice because I was able to bring uh, one of the representatives from Pioneer Energy because they had a lot of concerns about what the idea of Pioneer Energy was all about. And so it was one of, our, one of my first forays into having discussions about that in a community setting. And I thought it was a great discussion, a lot of great questions. And I look forward to having further meetings like that around the community. I think it's going to be important. Um, we've, I've been to two meetings for Christmas or for our uh, Festival of Lights. Uh, what's the official name for that again? Uh, Festival of Lights at Hometown Christmas. Yes, thank you. I didn't want to mess that one up. So, um, so uh, two meetings, kind of figuring out the streets and working with the uh, faith community led by uh, Pastor Al Soto. He has done an amazing job of bringing together, it's going to be close to 250 volunteers to to work throughout the evening supporting the merchants on main street and supporting the efforts to get that tree lit and all the things around that from street closures to to uh hospitality booths to cleaning up the messes to helping the restaurants to they're they're just going above and beyond to 
to support our community. And that's their mission, to support Placerville and support the merchants on Main Street. And so it's, it's been a real joy working with them and seeing, seeing them in action. And I tell you, those guys know how to get people together and how to get, get, a, get a production done. They do that every week. On, so it's, it's kind of like an old hat for them. So they're, they're working very hard, and it's an exciting to see what's going to be there. And it's for our community. Um, and it's, that's it's, Al. Al, Al Soto and his group. They're, yes. They're doing well, in multiple different, multiple and different, but different uh, churches okay. are are participating oh, in, in supporting this effort, oh, as well great. as I think the Boy Scouts and others to help clean up afterwards and oh, wow. during. And they have people that are managing trash and bathrooms and all sorts of stuff to make sure it's all neat and, and people have a good experience oh, downtown. Great. And we are going to have the most amazing sound system we have ever had on Main Street. You promise. I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> if it works, it's going to be amazing. So, so um, I echo the sentiments of Vice Mayor Taylor to our staff. I saw them out there on many occasions prepping for the storm, getting gutters clean, getting leaves out of there, uh, patrolling the creek and seeing what's going on. I know that I can't tell you who, but I know some people pulled a couch out of the creek before the before the um, before the flood, so that it wouldn't end up downstream plugging other things up. I won't tell you where or when, but I just know that that happened because oh, come on. <laughs> because I don't know if that's you know is it legal to remove a couch from the creek without a permit? <laughs> it's kind of like cleaning the streaks, sidewalks without a yeah. So at any rate, I I, I digressed. Um, I also attended Save the Graves, and I just need to do a quick. Shout out to Pat Cook, who's no longer with us. She passed away a couple years ago. She was an amazing individual. She lived to support and love this community. And one of her biggest passions was um, Gold Bug Park. And she is a longtime friend of mine and, uh, and a customer at the pharmacy. And, uh, and I just, you gotta, when you, once you meet her and you get over the initial shock, you have to love her. Because she is, she is, she's one of those bigger than life people that when she enters a room, everybody knows it. And she is just full, she was full of energy and uh, sorely missed and just a real blessing to our community. Uh, I also went to a St. John's fundraiser that's in Sacramento. And I tell you what, it still, it still gives me a model for ideas of what we can do up here, not at the scale. I think they raised a million dollars at that fundraiser, which was unbelievable and it was a pretty cool fundraiser too by the way it was a, a fundraiser did you bet on my silent item what was that heyday gift certificates uh <laughs> actually i did but it went for way too much uh, i mean good. they literally <laughs> raised over a million dollars to support the saint john's program down oh, in sacramento saint john's, saint john's oh. yeah it's a center that, that supports women coming out of uh into well, out of homelessness and out of situations okay. uh, abuse and different things where they can move into productive uh, communities with their kids and they have houses and all sorts of stuff it's amazing so uh i, I have to acknowledge that pg and e as much as i hate to say this has done a great job at, at, at cleaning our tr at uh, trimming trees we didn't have any power outages and this was a significant storm that we had and they have been they have been really uh working hard to get the trees cleared around our, our power lines and i think it's partly because of their effort that uh that we did not have a power outage in town Jackie and I's power went out for about an hour. Oh, I guess I should really appreciate, I, sh I guess I appreciate my power did not go out. They've been working very hard on my street. Did a tree fall on a line? Yes. I don't know what it was. It was only about an hour. It sucks for you. And yeah. Wow. Hmm. I stand corrected. The springs went out for a little bit too, but I did. They worked really hard on my street and I appreciate it. My too. My yes. street. I was, I was good. Thinking, yeah. It pays to be merry. Oh, I sh no, I shouldn't say that. No, I don't think that's the case. No. We have a lot of bad trees on my street. So, all right. With that said, I dug enough holes. I'm going to move on to the agenda. And um, all right, those were not brief comments, but we're going to go with it. You know, what? I forgot to, to mention that I also attended a couple meetings for the Eldorado Housing and the folks that are uh, trying to um, establish uh, overnight accommodations when the weather gets really bad for the. I did too. <laughs> Forgot so, about that I, one. And that they're working really hard. They're working really hard. I believe that they're at a the place where they have. I don't. I heard they may have seven nights a week covered for Good. those that wish to take advantage. Take of, advantage. Take advantage of the uh, what are they called? I, the, I uh, couldn't go to their meeting last yeah. night, but the one mm -hmm. before they had five five churches that mm -hmm. had uh, volunteered. And so two more. Hopefully that, they got the yep. two more. So. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So, and no PSPS is this this season. Again, a lot of the effort of Mark Acuna and our city staff working with PG&E to to really <laughs> get that dialed in, and because we did have some wind events, right. and we didn't have power outages because I I believe it's because of our work, and we also didn't have a fire. So, at least well. not in Plasterville, not because of that. So that's good. So consent calendar. All items listed under a consent calendar will be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion by roll call vote unless any member of the council wishes to remove an item for discussion. The reading of the full text of the resolutions will be waived unless that council member requests otherwise. Uh, is there anybody that would like to have any comments on any items or pull them? Mayor, could we, I'd like to, our city engineer Rebecca Neves to just make a correction. We don't need to pull it on item 7.6, the SFIA on Placerville Drive. Sure. If she can make that comment, please. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, we had a slight discrepancy between the staff report and the resolution. And the resolution, uh, I believe, is what needed to be corrected. It was referring to it as. Other way around. Other way the resolution is correct. Yeah, the resolution is correct. The staff report referred to a single family dwelling, and it's actually an accessory dwelling unit. My apologies. All right. Thank you. So the resolution is correct, so you can move forward with it as is. But okay. in the staff report, it say, states it's a single family residential, and actually it was an accessory building. So All right. Good. That was built. So. All right. Thank you for that. Um, if there's no discussion at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment on any item on the consent calendar. All right. Seeing nobody approaching the podium, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment and bring it back for any further discussion or a motion. I'll move uh, to adopt the consent. Second. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Pirelli? Aye. Councilmember No? Aye. Councilmember Saragossa? Aye. Vice Mayor Taylor? Mayor Thomas? Aye. All right, unanimous. All right, moving on to item eight, public comments on non-agendized items. Uh, this portion of the meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the council on any item or matter that is on any matter that is not on the agenda that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. State law prohibits the council from acting on any of these items except by special action. The mayor reserves the right to limit the speaker's time to three minutes. You are not allowed to make personal attacks or on individuals or make comments which are slanderous or which may invade an individual's personal privacy. And we're going to go right into item 8.1, written communication. No written communication to bring up this evening, Mayor. All right. Thank you very much. And oral communication, this is the part where uh, we open it up for public comment at the podium, and you will have... Uh, Three minutes. Nope. Do you there do want to hear me? Huh? <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm Sue Rodman, resident of Placerville for quite a while now. And uh, I am wondering what we are doing about the sheriff's proposal for having the homeless up there by what's supposed to be by the jail and eventually the new uh, courthouse. And if that's making any progress, I know there have been some uh, with the fire and the, and the cyclone bomb and stuff we've had. Uh, there's been, it's been hard to get this going, but when the original proposal came through, by the end of October, it was supposed to have something there for people. Well, it's the end of October. I don't see any progress. I'm wondering what's happening because the, the bomb cyclone already was a very difficult thing to get through. If you were homeless, that was a nasty storm. That was a nasty storm if you were inside let alone if you were on the street. So have we made any progress? Are we going to make any progress before the dead of winter sets in and these people are back on the street when it's cold and rainy, colder? Um, you know, what's going on there? I haven't heard anything in the last month about this, this whole proposal. 
except when they, we were putting aside some funds to to maybe allocate toward it with what was coming in from the recovery funds. But you know, what's how going on? Because we need to we need to push the sheriff. We need to push ourselves. We need to do something about this. These are human beings, and we have some responsibility to take care of them. And I'd like to congratulate Rebecca and the crew and whoever else worked on this rock wall next to the city parking lot here, because it looks amazing. It's great. And those are my comments for today. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Jane McGinnis, um, first of all, I'm sorry to tell you that um, the nomadic shelter idea does not have seven nights covered. Uh, we barely have two. Ooh. We had three. Green Valley's not sure anymore. They're thinking about it. Uh, I was not at Monday's meeting because I do grief share uh, on Monday nights, which makes it difficult. Um, Jonathan Gainsborough was there, and uh, the meeting was pretty much... Um, a circular discussion of, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? So here's what I intended to say, but I wanted to put that in first so that it would make some sense. Um, the creation of a winter shelter is no longer a project. It is now a whopping emergency. Uh, the storm that we had Sunday and Monday was 140 years, the worst one in 140 years. I was driving up Highway 50 on Sunday. I was driving past the camps, and I almost had to pull over because I was crying. I, all I could think of was these people are out in this rain, getting wet, getting cold, and there's no chance that they're going to get dry before they have to go to sleep tonight. Um, okay. This issue of the winter shelter is currently being addressed by the faith community, but it is not going well because they don't have a location. And the nomadic circle the wagon seven nights a week clearly is not going to work. Uh, there were only 18 people at the meeting on Monday night as opposed to the 35 who have been there the last three weeks. People are getting discouraged. So that's an urgency for me. Uh, I mean, that's a heart emergency. But my long-term focus has been, always will be, on a permanent shelter for the homeless where classes and learning and counseling and addiction services can be. The permanent shelter is making no headway and the winter shelter is right now looking pretty bad for the same reason. There's no location. And that's why they tried to circle the wagons with seven churches because there's no location. It doesn't matter if it's a piece of land or if it's an empty building. We need a location. We have got a lot of talent, a lot of knowledge on how to bring in the services, how to provide the services, but we are in a position where government says to us, bring us a plan and we'll find you a place. The point is until we know the place, we can't do a plan. Is it a building? Is it a piece of land? Do we need tents? Do we need tiny houses? What do we need? I am looking to you as the first step for first a winter shelter and hopefully a permanent shelter. We were talking in July and August about a piece of property up by the old dump that the city was willing to make available until the sheriff's plan came in. Now, research has found that the hostess plan as presented cannot be used because it will endanger federal funding in the future and some federal funding that has already been received. So, need a new plan. We can't have a plan until we have a place. So all I'm saying is, I'll tell you the same thing that I said to the county this morning, and I'm begging you, I'm praying that this is going to touch your heart. Archimedes said, you give me a lever and a place to stand, and I can move the world. People, we have what we need to pull it together, but we need a place to stand, and we have to look to you for that. Please talk among yourselves. Find us a piece of land. Find us an empty building. Thank you, We've got to get these people out of this weather. Thank and you. Let us build on that later for the future. Thank you. Jonathan Gainsborough, good evening, Council and Mayor. 
it was good to see uh, going the extra mile. It's nice to be quoting uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 41, where Jesus said, whoever compels you, we're speaking about the Roman soldiers, but whoever compels you, the government at that time, even though it was a hostile government, whoever compels you to go one mile, go two. But it's nice that you gave out that award. It's good to recognize people that are doing good things. You all are doing good things. Times change. I've been in Placerville 30 years. There was no homeless crisis 30 years ago. 20 years ago, there was no homeless crisis, not even nationally. But 15 years ago, there was Elliot. Elliot was just one person. Again, I'm saying Elliot was our homeless uh, nexus and uh, target. I bought him meals at Mel's, so did you. All of us did something to help him. But now we don't have one Elliot. We don't have five or ten. We don't have 25 or 50. We don't have 100. We don't have 200. We have 500 Western Slope homeless. We've got to do something. We've got to do something this winter. Last night at the uh, Federated meeting, there were half the number that were there when, Dennis, you were there with your beautiful wife, Wendy, and when uh, P Patty was there. And, and uh, it's great that you were there, though, the preceding meeting and, la and la last week. But last night, it was a massacre. I spoke with Don Vandekar. He also spoke to the soups this morning. But the truth of it is that Green Valley is, is contingent. Um, the, the Methodist one is talking to their board. But that's you know, not even two positives. And with the, with the COVID, um, moving the tents or partitions for eight years, the faith community has been doing what the city and county should have been doing. At least you were honest enough and brave enough to say, we realize we're 10 or 15 years behind this issue. I'm watching the clock, too. I've got uh, 40 seconds plus grace. Um, five and a half inches of rain, 140-year rain record. Which of us can excuse, which of us can excuse we didn't open town hall for a dry center? At least this half of it. Something. If your dog was out in the rain, you should be arrested if you left it out all night. We have an ordinance about that. If it's a crime to leave a dog out in five and a half inches of rain, how much less or how much more is it a crime to leave the homeless out with no shelter? We've got to do something this winter. Don't rely. The faith community can provide the volunteers. You've got to provide a place. And there are some dollars in your budget. Your son, your daughter, your grandson, your grandchildren are out there living like animals, living less than animals. We've got to together raise a roof and shelter them. It is your responsibility. The leper colony up on Upper Broadway does not have a Father Damien. Thank How you. sad it is that God has to use somebody like me to appeal to your hearts. What's wrong with me that I can't weep for them? Yep. And what's wrong with us that we can't shelter them? Let's do something. Let's not become a national city like Boise who refused to take care of their homeless. Let's do it this Thank winter. <clears throat> Thank you, Jonathan. All right. Anybody else for public comment? Good evening, Council Mayor. Could you pull the microphone down so I will do that. our home that audience it? can hear you there? Thank yes. You. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds Vander good. Carr. Yeah. I was just quoted or at least uh, maybe mentioned, uh, and I really do not have a prepared uh, speech, but I do want to remind you, as Jonathan was doing, that time is running out. We have people out there in the rain, in the cold, suffering. And I first started to get involved with homeless people back over three decades ago at the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church up in Camino, where I was sleeping on the floor with homeless just monitoring their activities. 
From there, I got involved in, very much involved with Hangtown Haven, which was a success. I know there were complications that it was probably an attractive nuisance, but we have quite a few people living in this community who were graduates of that program. Uh, and then more recently, uh, Jonathan was talking about the nomadic shelter. We are working hard. It is difficult. The virus situation makes it hard to figure out how we are going to operate. We haven't given up, but we're working hard to find ways so that we can uh, provide some shelter somewhere. But it is wet. It is cold. These people need to be assisted to uh, get back into normal life. So uh, it, is, it is time. Time has moved on. It is cold and wet. Let's do something. Thank you, Don. All right, seeing no one else approach the podium, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment at this time. We'll bring it back. Um, I want to thank everybody's uh, passion for the homeless and their efforts in moving that forward. I am sorry to hear about the number of uh, churches that have stepped up to do that to support the nomadic shelter. Um, yeah, there is... Um, Vice Mayor Taylor just asked if we can get an update on the <laughs> sheriffs. Uh, I don't believe that they have... I don't know that... The, I'm not... I don't have an inside track on that. Does anybody else know anything about... Uh, the only thing I would say, uh, Jane referred to it, uh, there's a report coming on November 9th from uh, the CAO's office that will report on that. And I, I don't know all the details, but I think it's similar to what uh, Ms. McGinnis has reported um, uh, regarding the, the hostess plan, I think it's being called, that was proposed at the sheriff's facility. So um, any meetings that were related to uh, setting that up were canceled until after this November 9th meeting. Uh, which is a board meeting right? Uh, when they'll have that information out. So. I know that they haven't canceled it, but I don't know that they have done anything. I don't know that there's, I haven't heard anything that's moving it forward at this point either. But I think due to this information that has come out, uh, that has put a hold on it until after mm -hmm. this. So there's not a lot of progress that has been made on it at this point. Okay. And, uh, okay. I'm really sorry to hear it, too. I mean, I, I thought that, the, the, I, like I said, I wasn't able to go to the last meeting, but the time before, I thought, you know, the, the people that raised their hands, I thought it was a for sure thing that you had five, you know. But I do know that, that they face a lot of the things that were presented that, that night is like um, some of the churches can't get insurance or they can't afford the insurance that it costs to have this extra, you know, um, and some of them, um, you know, they, they had a, a different reasons for it. It's not that they don't want to do it. There's just reasons that they can't. And so um, I'm really sorry to hear that That the, at least you didn't have the five. Uh, so. And I do know the COC is coming out with their strategic plan here in uh, within the next month or two. And... While that's a plan, I don't know that it's going to move the needle much right now, yep. and it's unfortunate. Um, but I do know that uh, I think conversations need to continue to be had with uh, the COC to further that uh, agenda. Um, with that, we're going to move on to item number, let's see. We have no item pulled from the consent calendar, item number 9. Number 10, we have no ordinances tonight. We have no public hearings, and so we're going to move on to item 12, which is the discussion and action items, which brings us to 12.1. Receive and file the county broadband master plan and prepare for entry point network. Provide direction to staff before you jump in here, Cleve. I would like to, I notice we have a few members of our um, peak, which has spent quite a bit of time uh, on this on this particular issue and has re reviewed and analyzed, pro provided a lot of input to help uh, uh, move this move this down, move this ball down the field a bit. And I wanted to thank you, the members that are here, as well as those that aren't, for, for their uh, uh, gracious effort. And I know Peak has, has been, you know, it's, uh, you know, you kind of get into the weeds on these things. And, you know, you do things and have conversations we can't have here. And, 
and and take the time to dig in and that's part of what we what we ask peak to do is is uh, dig into those things so i want to express my appreciation uh, for the effort and volunteer volunteer time that you put in to help support our community and with that i'll turn it over to cleve thank you mayor and council um so as you know uh, earlier this year uh, actually back in may i believe it was the council contracted with uh, entry point networks to complete a broadband master plan for the city uh, they've been working on that since that time in close uh, relationship with uh, the peak who has kind of provided information and assisted with that process and so they have completed the study you have a copy of that in your agenda tonight we have uh, uh, Jeff Christensen from Entry Point and Bruce, Pat Bruce Patterson to uh, do this presentation and then when they're completed we can talk about uh, as well as part of theirs they'll talk about next steps also but we can talk about where we go from here so with that I'll turn it over to Jeff first I believe and then we'll continue so Dave if you can yeah you okay thank you great thank you um, nice to be back in Placerville and appreciate the committee that's worked hard with us and and paid attention to um, some technical things as we've worked through this so I'm Jeff Christensen I'm the president of entry point and uh, Bruce Patterson is here with me um, I'm we're gonna try and be efficient in terms of um, not drag you through too much minutiae but um, hopefully give you time to ask questions about the report the organization of the report is there's a key findings section at the beginning and there's a next steps section at the end and those sections are kind of an, an overview of the entire report um, and then what we've put into this PowerPoint presentation is really a distillation of those two sections key findings and next steps um, the part of the report that's most interesting to me and the most interesting part to work through with cities is the strategy part of the report we're not going to get into that tonight but it, it really starts with what are the priorities for the city and that was a process we worked through got feedback from the committee members and that's that's in the strategy section of the report um, like a lot of communities that's focused on economic development creating more choice and competition that, um, through competition um, putting pressure on the price of broadband services um, so we go into some detail on those strategy elements uh, <clears throat> There, we've got a summary of market analysis I think everybody's aware that Comcast Xfinity and AT&T are the two providers AT&T being the telephone company Xfinity being the cable company across the country the cable companies have basically taken over suburban and urban markets so where there's any density in housing cable companies they have more bandwidth in their wire and so across the country this is the story the cable companies are dominating this market and that's true in Placerville as well so I'm not gonna I, you know I think you all have a sense of what you're paying um, the concern is obviously when you get to a monopoly status for any goods or services there's a cost to them to being a, a, a subscriber to a monopoly and and so I think that's a key a key concern for peak as we work through it and I think an important concern for any community in the country um, that monopoly status AT&T will put fiber to businesses it, it tends to be very expensive um, it is occurring in El Dorado County and in Placerville but I think Comcast is carrying the day in terms of their domination of the market uh, there is a there's a tool out there there's a, an entity in Washington DC called M labs and M labs you can go out onto their website and for any county in the US you can pick a period of time you can pick 30 days you can pick 90 days you can see how many speed tests were run in that county so it wasn't confined to Placerville it was El Dorado County 
but we pulled the data into the report from those speed tests. So you can see what people are getting, and, and we're summarizing it here. I think we, we, for the report, I think we pulled in a 30-day snapshot. I think the sample size is big enough to be predictive. And so people are getting around 90 megabits per second on the download and about 8 megabits per second on the upload. When you go over to AT&T, it's, it's one megabit and, and a third of a megabit. So, you know, sorry for those people. That's what I have. <laughs> so, you know, sorry. hopefully you can get an email out. You're probably not watching a movie. <laughs> I'm going to send them a note tomorrow. <laughs> um, but that is the reality. So, you know, I think everybody has some sense of this. When you look at the different media that are available, DSL is what AT&T will have in, in most of its pr footprint in Placerville. And so that's that smallest dot. Starlink is Elon Musk's satellite system. So everybody, you know, a lot of people are excited about this. Um, and it's a great option if you're, you know, if you're deep in the woods. Um, it's not a great option. It's an option. Um, and then cable's much more robust, and so the size of those circles tells you why Comcast has a monopoly. It's, they've just got a bigger circle. And the reality is that, um, you know, they're promising 5G, but 5G is dependent on fiber. And f the definition of 5G's got a little fungibility to it. Um, when 5G will come to the county and what it will look like is to be determined. The reality is fiber's got that much difference in magnitude, in, in capacity, so speed and bandwidth. And so we're very comfortable saying everybody in the US is going to get fiber eventually. Uh, we think that's a 15 year window. People may argue justifiably with that window. A key question is who's gonna own the fiber? We think whoever does own it will have a monopoly. So the cable companies have killed the telephone companies, the DSL companies. Fiber, we think, is going to kill cable just because of the size of that circle. So the question is who's gonna own it and what are they gonna behave like as an owner? We think it will be monopolistic and our whole orientation as a company is towards publicly owned infrastructure. So all this money coming out of the federal government, too much of it is going to get shoveled into private hands. It's public money, but it's going to, in the process, through lobbying and various other strategies, it's going to go, get transferred from public hands to private hands. And those private hands are going to be monopolies in too many places. So. Part of our orientation as a company is to work with cities and counties and cooperatives to transfer public money into public hands, public control of infrastructure that's accountable to the lo people locally. And, and as, we move, as we make this transition to fiber, it's, we think, very important that that fiber is managed locally and controlled by the public. Um, I'm not going to go into detail. Everybody's on a shared network in this country right now. That means you're sharing with 16, 32, or 64 neighbors, and that affects the reliability of your network. Uh, it matters today. It's going to matter more in the future. So we believe in, in uh, dedicated networks that are not shared. Uh, in terms of the results, I want to get Bruce to talk about a couple of things. So I'm just going to say the results are in there. This slide says that... Um, there's support for a city-backed network. 75% uh, said they would support it out of those who responded to the survey. I won't go into each of the items, but the support's there. Um, people care about speed. They care about service. You can do this in California. California is really the thought leader now in broadband uh, with Senate Bill 156. Um, that is thought leadership across the country. It's the best thing happening in broadband right now is California legislation. Um, massive good is going to come out of that, I think. And so you can do it. Uh, they've cleared the path and they're, they've set up financing mechanisms. Um, we are projecting, if it's 100% aerial, which it probably wouldn't be, around $55. 
This number does not account for supply chain disruption, which is happening everywhere today. So there's a lot of variability in this market and in all markets right now because of the supply chain. So that this number does not account for whatever fluctuations the supply chain is going through today or may go through over the next six to 12 months. So we think that's probably a 10 to 20% impact right now in terms of the cost of materials. Uh, we think it'll settle down on the one hand, but as the federal government injects massive money and California does, we don't know what that inflation looks like for labor and materials. And then if we go 50-50 um, on infrastructure and, and aerial, the number's around $59. So I'm going to turn it over to Bruce. Bruce got into some very detailed design work with an engineering firm. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Bruce and let him speak to that. Can he sit there just to run that computer? Thank you. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a little bit. I'm going to uh, see if I can drive. <laughs> so as Jeff mentioned, I think I'll just introduce myself. My, my name's Bruce Patterson. Um, I left the city of Ammon. I was their technology director for 17 years and actually Bruce, built their municipal. Bruce, Bruce, if you could just either move the mic a little bit closer to you or something, because I want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to hear what you're saying. Is that better? A little better, yes. A little better? Yes. I'll better. talk a little louder. How about there you that? go. <laughs> All right. So my name is Bruce Patterson, and I worked for the city of Ammon in Idaho for 17 years. Uh, city Council came to me in 2006 and indicated that they felt a disadvantage because the city of Idaho Falls had an electric utility and a fiber optic system, and they asked me to solve the problem. Um, so I worked on that for a long, long time. We actually connected our first homes in 2017. Today, they are still completing that, but I left the city to try and help other cities replicate what we did in the city of Ammon. Uh, and so I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, and Jeff has tasked me with trying to help cities understand how to build this infrastructure, how to fund it. Uh, we focus on treating it as a utility and municipal ownership for the infrastructure only, not for the service. So nothing in what we would advise you would tell you that the city should be an internet service provider. Rather, you would create roads, and those roads would be open for the services, and you would introduce competition. So that, that's what we've talked about with the peak committee. And the design, the architecture we're going to show you here supports that operational model. Now, clearly, you can do other types of operations on this infrastructure, but that's kind of the intent in what we have here. So let me kind of drill into what was done. So this probably looks familiar. That's Placerville there. And somewhere along the lines over the last couple of years, I suddenly need these. <laughs> if we, we can kind of open some of this up, you'll see that this is described as a cabinet um, it could be a cabinet, it could be a shelter or a, a type of a concrete hut. They're actually serving locations that are distributed. There's one down here. They're placed right now currently on city properties. These are hypothetical, but it gives you an idea that we actually identified locations. And if I want specific information, right now we have five of those locations that serve the neighborhoods. And I can actually get even more information by drilling down into that information, that data. I can actually uh, go visit this and find out exactly how many homes are being served out of it right now, 446. And we could basically go in and tell the system that we want to serve more homes and reduce it. And we could identify one of those serving locations we want to do away with. So what I'm trying to help you to see is that this is an iterative process. We start by identifying city properties that could serve it, and then we actually use software 
to determine what's the most economical. So the whole goal is to reduce the fiber count and the expense associated with the build. This is a first run that I'm showing you. Uh, typically, we can get even more efficient, and we will reduce costs by about 10 to 20 percent in partnership with our – this is not entry point ourselves. We actually have a design firm, an engineering partner that we refer to, that we have a master services agreement. Uh, they do it very efficiently for us. Their costs are typically about 30 percent less than industry standard. And they deliver it and do it all in a software platform. So for your public works and your city engineer, um, right now, today, these, shape, these shape files are available to you. Uh, this collaborative environment is available to you. We can, we would basically take this, refine this design a little bit, and uh, either city staff or someone we could hire, depending on how you want to do it, would actually go and drive some of this and assure constructability, make notes in the system that would then be modified, run again. And that's, that's basically the design process. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, let me get back into some of the details. So for example, right now we know there's, if you look right here, it, it's telling us that there's 467,000 feet of conduit path. It tells us exactly how many feet of cable. There's uh, 1,219,000 feet of cable to do all of Placerville. So what we're trying to help you understand here is that we actually generate a complete bill of materials to do this construction, which allows us to go and get current pricing. And so what you're seeing us deliver to you in terms of projected cost, it's based on this level of design. Now, I want to make sure I'm very clear here. We have not yet refined it. We just talked about constructability so that you have to drive it, make sure it's correct. But typically that actually results in a reduction of cost because the way we do this initial design assumes the worst, as it were, not the best case. And so, like you said, and normally it, we'll see material reduction of about 10 to 20 percent. Um, we do do an architecture that involves having excess fiber in the road. Uh, it's based on the fact that every single home would eventually have a fiber. Uh, we do do, basically, we identify the neighborhood and we would look at take rate and come back and be able to refine those numbers and say, this is really what they're going to cost. It would involve engineering analysis if the city were to move forward to determine what is the take rate, what's the mechanisms you're going to use, and what is the city going to house this in? Is it part of public works? Is it part of IT? Is it a completely new department? Or is it something you want to outsource? Meaning you could own it and you could choose to have a private company maintain it for you. But we've, we do very clearly separate the infrastructure from the actual services that are on it. So those are two separate things and, and the skill set required to do infrastructure operation is completely different than running a network. So um, you can turn on and off various layers here. Uh, just as an example, we could turn off, you know, some of the, the fiber loops. We know how many splice enclosures. We can turn those off, and you can drill down and see it. But this is something that we've made available to some of your city staff. We're happy to open it up and make it available to any of you if you wanted to poke around in it. We did identify the total service locations at 4,015. So our current estimate based on the data we got from your GIS system is that you're going to serve about four, just over 4,000 addresses if you go to everybody. Are there any questions I could answer about this? Is it reasonable to think if there is population clusters immediately outside of the city limits, we can provide service to them as well? Absolutely, you can. Um, again, you know, I think you're – as you would certainly recognize, there's some value to that, but it comes down mm -hmm. to the mechanisms, right? So where's your territorial authority end and how do you negotiate right to access to get there? Is there additional cost for that? Is, are you going to deliver that for exactly the same price as those within your city? Um, so those are questions that I would ask. I can tell you in the city of Ammon, we did do it to some outside. They did not receive it at exactly the same cost. Right. Um, we did actually have some people annex into the city solely for the purpose of getting the same price. It wasn't, it wasn't, 
It wasn't a significant price difference, which is interesting, but I will tell you the funding mechanisms, not the monthly rate, but the funding mechanisms are completely different because if you do operate this as a utility, there are utility financing mechanisms, revenue bonds, improvement districts, and some other things you can leverage that you cannot use outside of your territorial boundary. So they actually annex so that we could help them fund the build to their property. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Mayor, if I can add to that too, we have had discussions, I have had discussions with the county about the potential to expand beyond our, our city limits and working with them together uh, in the future. So they, they are interested in that. They so, are. Yes. Thank you. So if there are no further questions on the design, um, I'm going to move into, Jeff mentioned kind of key findings and the next steps. So I'm going to move into next steps. Uh, I just mentioned I kind of came on in, in June, and so Cleve mentioned you started in May, and so I've been kind of pulling my, myself up here and trying to get going. And so I was involved in some of those final discussions and helped with some of this engineering, but I haven't been able to participate in every single meeting. But I, I have been asked to kind of talk about next steps. Um, so let's, let's kind of discuss that, what it looks like. Let me bring this to a close here or at least get it down and let's come back to our, our presentation here. So th there's a whole bunch of granular detail here that's in the report and I'm going to put it to you this way. It, you're talking about eating an elephant, right? And, and it's not necessarily always intuitive because the industry makes it very complicated. And you're talking about taking on something that is an investment and you're going to have to answer the question, why? Why are you in the business? Why are you doing it? So Jeff, I think, tried to summarize the biggest reason why we would advise it. Because you have gaps and you don't have genuine competition. And to fill those gaps, they're asking for public money. This is not new. Private businesses ask for public money for over a decade to fill the broadband gaps. The problem is it has not moved the needle. And the reason why is because you have to understand that a private business has an incentive to get the best ROI. And the gaps you're asking them to fill is not the return on investment that they need or want. That's why they're asking for your money. Yes, they can build to them, but it, in our experience, it does not change pricing. All you've done is empowered their monopoly and taken off the edge so they can get it, but they still charge the same price. What we have found, and speaking for myself and Ammon, is that controlling the infrastructure and making that investment as a public entity for the benefit of the community is a completely different incentive. Because if you think about your public parks, your other utility systems, if those were privatized and they were operated for commercial profit, they would not exist or they would be completely different and you wouldn't even recognize them. So from our perspective, the question that you as city council and elected officials need to answer is, do you feel good about creating a public utility that is the infrastructure that will be open for business for anybody to use to create competition that will improve the services and push the price down. <clears throat> so fundamentally, as a guy that's lived through it, that's, that's what I would say, is that would be the reason. The, the reason isn't just about fast internet. It's about doing what's right if you feel like this is an essential service. So one of the things we would talk with you about is making it clear in your city ordinance that you're going to treat broadband as an essential service. And that's the reason that you're going to make these investments because you're going to do it for cost of recovery, not for profit. And nobody's going to ever be able to do it cheaper than you can as a municipal utility. So you're going to bridge an affordability gap. You're going to have mechanisms that allow you to invest in areas where the private sector just is not going to do it. And those are things that you're, you're going to get. So rather than me go through this, all of this detail, I we would like to just say to you today that fundamentally the next steps if you wanted to move forward were to, to take the next couple of steps with the information we're giving you. So you kind of have some financial modeling 
But you really need, and we've given you some financial mechanisms that you can use, so let's talk about a couple of them, grants. There are grants available. They're very specific, so we have to look at the area you want to build in, but there, is grant, there are grants available to do a capital project. The question is, what's available there? Who are you overbuilding? And we need to get down to that data and decide if the city wants to apply for those grants. Many of them require a match. So you're going to have to make decisions about those. There's excellent funding from the state. State of California, I agree with Jeff. They are ahead in this concept of if we're going to take public money, we're not going to hand it to a private company any longer. We're going to expect the cities and the counties to build something, and we're going to expect them to figure out the ownership and partnership models. And I think they're exactly right. So Senate Bill 156 identified $750 million that will go into a revolving loan fund only for cities and counties. They have not yet determined what that will look like, but they are saying up front that they're counting on 20 to 30 year loans that behave like a municipal bond at 2% interest or so with no initial payment in the first year. So they're talking about giving money to the public entity to build a system and get revenue streams coming in to do it. So. Part of the reason we don't have that yet is because that bill also talked about this advisory committee that will be under the Department of Technology in the state, and they're still building that. So once that's there, then, then you'll start to see these rules come out. But we feel like that's the best option. In fact, we feel like that's the right option, not to give it away, but to do what we did when we built power companies. Low interest loans over long periods of time public ownership, whether it's a co-op, a municipality, or whatever, so that the people being served actually have a voice in the fees and the rates that are actually charged. So that's available for financing. The other thing that's out there is you've got some potential for some cost sharing. You know, you get PG&E, and you have a number of issues, and they're going to spend some big money, and they're going to open up the ground. And so we don't know exactly what that looks like, but if you were to take a step forward and put your nose in the tent and say, we are going to do this, that completely changes the discussion because it's no longer we think or we might, what could you do for us? It is, we are going to do this. How can we help you and how can you help us? So a little bit more definitive action we would encourage. Um, so that would help you with the financing piece. The second thing is a big, huge portion of this is community engagement. So this is not a technical problem, and to be honest with you, it's not really a finance problem. It's a leadership issue, and it's community engagement, and it's an educational process for your community because you're going to get a variety of responses from your citizens. They're going to ask you why you're involved in it. They're going to ask you what it's going to cost. They're going to ask you a lot of those questions. So another item we would say is a, an important next step is to start to identify how do you start that process, what does it look like? And again, you have some assets. You have Sacramento State and some students and programs that I think would actually give you some good marketing at virtually no cost and also educate these students that want to be in marketing. So you've got a pretty nice asset there, and I think the school, we've made some initial conversations, contacts, and I think they're willing to work with that. And then you can decide whether or not you need a little bit more help, be it professional services, or we can show you things that we've got. Now, we're not professional market people, but I can tell you from my experience in Ammon, it's really important that you identify the neighborhood you're going in, that you publish online maps where you're working or the contractor's working, and that you, you know, we did things like door hangers. The week before, we would go down the street and say, hey, we're going to be there. A QR code that had a ticketing system so that if there was a hole in their yard or a problem with their property they wanted fixed, they basically scanned that, typed their name in there. The right person gets the email to go fix that, and when they're done, they say they're done within that system. That resident now gets an email back that says, hey, we think we're done. If not, send another email. All of those things really made the, our citizens just love what we were doing with the city of Ammon compared with what they had in experience with the current providers because it was not what was going on. Holes in the yard, calling the city saying, why would you dig in your yard? It wasn't even the city. It was the incumbent providers. So. Those are examples of things where we feel like you need to kind of lay those steps out. What's your, what's your plan to engage the community? What does the plan look like? And so we would encourage you to think about those next steps, and part of that probably involves if you're going to need some outside help, who's the professional consulting firm that's going to kind of guide you through that and manage that process. And so that really is something that 
you folks internally have to decide is if that's where you're at. So those we feel like are the next steps, but really that's the, the first bite of the elephant. We still haven't really identified where you're borrowing the money from, what exactly do the rates look like. So it is going to be a step-by-step, -step, but it does seem to be like the next logical step in terms of what Peak found, the committee, and what we're saying today. So I think based on that, I'm just going to turn it back. Well, first of all, let me ask, are there any questions that I need to answer before I turn it back to Cleve? A lot to take in? It is. Um, as far as Ammon and the, the um, how it is today, has there been, you know, I, I, government, the idea of government doing anything uh, in, this, in this realm, you know, is somewhat sometimes challenging. And I say that from a user point of view in terms of uh, uh, whether it's health care or, or, you know, SMUD, I think, has done a good job in Sacramento for them. And we actually, we have a, uh, a for-profit uh, PG&E in Sacramento has a not-for-profit. And we were kind of at SMUD's doorstep with our uh, played out uh, saying, can, can you help us? And they said, oh, geez, we wish we could, but it's just was not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, no thank you. So um, so I, I have mixed feelings about the idea of government getting involved in something like this, and I like it. So what's been the experience in Ammon to date? If you have the contacts, I'm sure you're talking to them a fair bit still. Yes. Um, in terms of the uh, public perception of the public-run utility. So... We haven't done a survey for a while of the residents that actually get the service, and I'm going to focus on the residents because I think that's what you're asking me about, not necessarily the businesses or the schools because they love it. I mean, no giant surprise, right? We have good relationships, but it's the question is the residents. So let me focus on that. The last one we ran, we did a traditional how happy are you, how, would you recommend it? So that's, that's like a five button answer, you know, whether you want to say I wouldn't or you're very satisfied or you're just satisfied. So 85% clicked satisfied or very satisfied. And that might not sound like I, I will be honest with you, I was a little disappointed. I'd hope for a little bit more. <laughs> but in terms of making a comparison with the cable or phone companies, they're under 30%. So everybody that I know of that took it is happy typically if they're a little bit unhappy it's because they had a little bit of expectation about the installation so just as an example we don't get complaints about the pricing or the speed when they had the dissatisfaction in the survey it was that they didn't like that the sod we put in died a few days later and things like that so that was a dissatisfaction um, I think you could talk with, I mean, I'm happy to give you references to the mayor or the city council. In fact, I think that would benefit you, and I know they would talk to you. I think they would tell you this, because it was my experience. As a city employee, I dealt with a lot of negativity, because they're far more prone to talk to you when they don't like something. I, mean, I got complaints. I got complaints when I put a phone system menu in, and somebody didn't answer the phone and say hello. You know, uh, So... I liked it because I felt like it was a way to contribute something positive that over half the people really loved. Um, we used local improvement districts, <clears throat> and that's a, that's a public process that creates them. I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to do it, but I think I'm giving you this as a frame of reference. When you create a local improvement district, you notify every affected property, and they have a chance to come in and tell council, don't you dare come in my yard and run that stuff, that garbage down my yard, or they have a chance to come in and say, would you please, please do my neighborhood. We never had anybody show up to those public hearings and say, don't you dare do it. We did have people say, come in and say, I'm concerned because I'm not really going to sign up for it. I want to know what you're going to do with my yard. And we had to dispose of those issues and questions as part of that process. So that's really about the most negative we dealt with in, in I think it's no surprise to you folks that there's always one in ten that no matter what you do, it's not going to really work for them. Really, it's usually 50-50, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we do get a few of those, but it's mm -hmm. been enormously successful. Um, 
So when you do an LID process, it funds the project and the project gets done and then you divide the cost of the project equally amongst the, the properties that said they wanted it. So we treated this as a property rights issue and that's, that's the way we got it. We had to actually do a judicial confirmation. Your attorney, I'm sure, is familiar with what we went through to do that. Because state statute in Idaho is very, very fuzzy. There's no express authority, and we are a Dillon state when it comes to utilities, meaning that if the state does not convey the authority on the local government authority, they don't have the authority to do it. So what we did is we, we went to court and we said, but this affects public health and safety. This affects the economic vitality of our system or of our community. And the court sided with us and they said, we agree, this falls within your purview because the state does not address broadband because it's a newer thing and the state has not contemplated, they've not adopted any statutes or addressed broadband. We agree that you can treat it like sewer and water. They did confine us to, you have to treat it like sewer and water. We could not build out as a cable system. We could not treat it as an enterprise type of function. So we were limited by that, and which was really a blessing because we like that utility authority. It worked very well for us and the funding mechanisms work really well. So uh, I kind of wandered off course. I don't know if that kind of answered your question, but that was our experience. Um, our take rate is uh, 60%. So out of every 10 homes we pass, six, six homes take it. When COVID started, uh, we were having one home that didn't sign up initially with the LID sign up. So if you, if you understand how LID works, that's the chance to bond for it. The city has no authority to finance it. And as you can imagine, as a new utility, the fiber optic department doesn't have a massive reserve. So people wrote checks for $3,600 to have us connect their home because it was so important to them. But once that's paid for, uh, they only pay $2,650 a month for one gig service. Um, brand new homes in Ammon all have fiber. It's all city owned. Um, the annexation agreements have the right language. The developers install all of the infrastructure. My team pulls the cable and, and they're not my team any longer. The city team pulls the cable and splices it. Uh, when the building inspections get phoned in, there, there are specific phases. We actually perform an inspection to make sure the property is ready. Uh, as those things are made ready, we pull the cable through the, the conduit that goes up against the side of the home. and. Uh, when the conduit inside the home is ready, we pull the cable in that. And then when they phone in final inspection, we actually do the install of the electronics. So when they come into the city and they say, hey, I just bought a new home, our staff that signs them up for city services, which includes sewer, water, and garbage, they, they will look and they'll say, well, your, your brand new home has city fiber. Do you want to use it? And they'll say, well, what does that mean? How does it cost? Well, you pay the city $16.50 a month. You get access to a marketplace that has four separate providers. The lowest cost package is $1.88 a month. The highest cost package is $25 a month. There's one gig available for $10 a month, $15 a month, and $25 a month, depending on which one you want. Um, nobody, we have not had anybody not take it. And I think this is significant for you to understand as well. The cable company and the phone company are in the process of dis discontinuing putting infrastructure in those developments because it's not sustainable for them. So this is a change. It is a sea change. Uh, I think it's important for you to recognize, just like Jeff said, this will end up being a monopoly on the infrastructure side. The question is who will own it and what will their purpose be in owning it? All right. Good question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the, the price actually is very competitive, I think, that what, what you're mm -hmm. quoting there. My question is, I don't know the topography or the age of, the, you know, of houses in Ammon, uh, but, you know, here you got everything from 1840 to, you know, 2021, and every, you know, and everything in between, and, and a very challenging topography that's mostly uh, on lines, on telephone poles. Um, I mean, are we still looking at the same cost point structure? And then a uh, piggyback on that is, um, do you need a certain amount of density in a neighborhood for it to, for it to work? So in other words, you only have one house and on X street, um, is the city going to pull fiber, you know, all the way over to it in order to accommodate that, that person? Does it take a certain amount of, of density to, to make it work? Yes. So you're talking about take rate. 
Take rate is that number, how many out of 10 will take it, or how many of 100. Take rate is absolutely critical, and public engagement will drive that. So the right tools and the right messaging are absolutely critical. Um, that's, that's why I would really advise that as part of your next steps, you need to kind of identify that messaging. And, and truthfully, you kind of have to figure out what is the city's role. We kind of advised you and said it's infrastructure and that it's open access. You, that, that would be up to you folks. That city council's decision. You've got a recommendation from a committee and a, an entity that tried to help guide them through and give them a bunch of factual information about costs and options. But really, you guys have to decide, and you're exactly right. That's why that process is absolutely critical, because you're going to start a process, and frankly, once you stick the shovel in the ground and you start, there's no going back. So you need a plan that says, when does revenue start to come in? How is this sustainable? Where do we house it? And who's responsible? Who's going to make us a success? Um, so it is. And, and the cost I, the Oh, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Mayor. Yeah. Uh, the cost, I mean, I know you, you threw out a number of like 3,500 to sort of connect in, but knowing, I mean, I'm sure you've talked to Cleve about our topography and challenges here. Are you still comfortable with that number as a number for Placerville? I think it depends on whether you insource a certain amount of the construction or whether you outsource it. So I could relate to you a whole other story. So if City of Ammon wanted to outsource all construction, we created an LID. We did a, a campaign, you would call it a marketing campaign, where we got signups. And part of our signups was they actually signed a piece of paper that said they understood that their house was going to get a lien and that they were going to pay on a bond. And that's hard. That's a tough sell. We got 73% did it. In the first neighborhood that beat 50% was the neighborhood we said we'd do it, and that neighborhood beat 50%, so we turned it into a competition. And by the time we were done with that project, that was 73% take rate. 20% of those people, when we were done, paid that debt off. Didn't let it sit on the property. They just paid it. The comment I would make to you is this. It's what Jeff said. Somebody's going to build fiber to your properties. The question that remains is, when? Is it 10 years or 20 years? And the next significant question is, who's going to own it? So the answer I would give you is, it's probably going to be more than that. But whatever problems you're going to face, Comcast is going to face them. at t is going to face them. Whoever does it is going to face exactly the same problems. And guess who's going to pay for it? You guys and your citizens. They're going to pass it right through to you. We could demonstrate for you right now, because we just showed you what we think you're paying on average. And all we would have to do is figure out how many of you are taking Comcast, and we could tell you how many literally hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars are leaving your community today. This is about reducing that amount and keeping it here. That's what this is really about. It's a redirection of how you want to spend your money and what solution you want. Is it a community solution or is it an outsourced private solution? Which strategy makes sense to you? I think California has paved the way for you folks to say, we want to try it ourselves. It will only be the adventurous, and there is risk. I don't want you to think there isn't. But I, I often said, I said this to my city council, risk, reward. You have to accept both. Low risk, low reward. High risk, higher reward. I personally believe with the right people and the right management, you can achieve exactly what Ammon did, but you're going to have to take it one step at a time the very first step is, do you folks believe you should be in this business? Do you folks believe you should be in this infrastructure business? If the answer is yes, then it is a leap of faith, just like the people that started your utility systems other places, just like SMUD. Thank you. Yep. So, All right. I'm going to go ahead and – can we get the – Regina, can we get the lights, please? Could I ask one – yeah, please. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, piggyback on what uh, Michael asked you, but um, the city of Ammon. So what I'm thinking is that we have uh, really quite an, an older population, and I'm not sure, um, and I are one, <laughs> but I'm not sure how much um, that they really feel the need for this. So could you address that? Um, 
I am just a firm believer, you know, I, I, I know this, this is where we're going, and I, again, we're talking about the youth of our county, I, I think for no other reason, um, for their, you know, their uh, benefit. But anyway, uh, so sure. go ahead. Sure. So there's a couple of comments I would make. The first is, is that we all acknowledge that remote work, remote education, they're not going away. They're here to stay, right? So if you want to attract those people and you want to be a community pe where people want to come and live because they can now work wherever, you're going to have to have this connectivity. If you don't, they're not going to choose your community. Okay, I think so we've already seen that, really. So, so that's, that's my first comment. The second comment is national study after national study proves that a publicly owned fiber optic to a home increases the property value by somewhere between $3,000 and $5,000. Mm. Wonder where they got that number from. Maybe it's because that's what it costs. So part of what we helped some of those in your situation in Ammon understand are those two things. What's your property worth? And when we go through the neighborhood and you choose not to do it, what happens when you try to sell it? So I can tell you for a fact, the Realtor Association asked the city to publish a map so that they knew who had fiber and who didn't because they had a lot of issues with people buying homes thinking there was city fiber there because the seller said there was and then found out there wasn't. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of issues. So I can actually point you to that map that we published so that the public knows this address has fiber, this doesn't because Nine out of ten buyers that come into the city of Ammon to buy the home do it because Ammon has the fiber. Because guess what? Houses cost virtually the same in the county as they cost the city of Ammon. Taxes are slightly higher because Ammon obviously has some, some, some taxes. Mm -hmm. But they want to know where the fiber is. So then what happens is if they did not get fiber as a term of the sale, they have to go fund a fiber installation with the city before the buyer will buy it. And that is a very common occurrence. So these are things that we need to make sure are understand by your community. I would really put it to you this way. It's an investment in your community, and you can wait for somebody else to make the investment, but then they get all the benefit. Because it's their investment. It's not yours. This is your investment. <coughs> Okay. Thank you. I, I know we, it, you know, this has been a problem in our town. I, I'm going to just address Comcast. I mean, there's still people that can't get Comcast. And what we've been told is that there's not enough money for them to, you know, expand their territory, et cetera. And they won't do it. And so, you know, um, that is of interest, I guess, if going with, a, a, like you say, another, another, uh, route um, it would assure that it would be done so you know can we be honest here we have to respect their investment these companies came in and they were a video service right and that would be great but the problem is is the service you care about isn't the service they actually came in and got access to your right ways for right. and the franchise fees they're paying you is for that video service and I I would predict for you if you go look your franchise fees payments are going down every year because they're reducing the number of people that will take video and it's all moving to internet. Mm. So I, I would make this comment. We should respect them, but we're out of calling it a luxury. And we're talking out of both sides of our mouth. We're saying it's essential, but we're not treating it like essential because we're allowing monopoly providers that charge for 30% profit to continue to charge that when we have people that can't afford it and they're being left behind. So I would predict that the models we're describing here today those that adopt them are going to be on the forefront, but they are not going to be alone, especially over the next five years. You're just going to be in a crowd. You will take some arrows, and you're going to stand up and take a position of leadership in the state, but you will be respected for that if you do it for the right reasons, and you will be successful if you do it for the right reasons. Uh, thank you very much. Yep. I really appreciate you, all your uh, comments and your detailed examples of what's been working and how um, I'm curious is there we have the um, peak here do, do either one of you want to say anything regarding this before I go open to public comment good evening mayor Thomas City Council members, staff, and the two chiefs back there. <laughs> uh, I'm Mickey Kaiserman, a resident of Placerville. I've been a member of PEAK, the Placerville Economic Committee, since 2015. 
The broadband uh, master plan that has been prepared by Entry Point has been reviewed and approved by PEAK and the PEAK broadband subcommittee that I'm a member of. I want to thank Jeff and his team at Entry Point for preparing a comprehensive broadband master plan. Broadband is the most exciting economic opportunity available to Placerville since I have been on peak. Broadband will make existing businesses more efficient, has the potential to bring in new businesses to Placerville, and the residents of Placerville will see increased download and upload speeds at a reasonable cost. As presented in the plan, municipal broadband is not new and has been operating in cities across the USA. Federal and state funding is now available and other cities will be vying for these funds in California. Placerville must take the next steps as presented. Uh, if Placerville is gonna be ahead of most cities, by, is, is ahead of most cities by having prepared this broad plan, broadband master plan. I'm asking the city council to direct the city manager to proceed with the next steps of the broadband master plan as time is of the essence in obtaining federal and state funding. Thank you. And one other thing, you were talking about the risk earlier. I th really, the key is that we have to get the take rate. So as long as we can convince citizens in specific areas to take this, then you move ahead with it. It's not like you just build the whole thing out and they'll come. You go ahead, we educate everybody, we get them on board, and once we get those concentrations, that's where we put it in. It's pretty straightforward. And those costs they're showing you, remember they showed aerial, I think the one they showed was, it was a 60% take rate, and it was, I think they had the 50-50 aerial and in the ground. And, oh, they did 100% aerial, and there's a lot of places here in town that are in the ground, and hopefully in the future, PG&E might go in the ground, we can join along with them and put this fiber in the ground. But it, it's essential, this is an essential service and we're gonna give monopoly power, as they said, to Comcast and AT&T if they put the fiber in. And, we're, and we could get, see their, their time frame is much shorter than, our, than ours. We could go long-term financing, they're gonna look at 10-year financing and they have profitability and tied into that. So it's gonna cost a lot more. And all these services, we can, we can farm some of them out, we can do them internally, but we'll decide that as we go through this process. So I really strongly believe that you, we move ahead with this as soon as possible. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mickey. Hi, <clears throat> Adam Anderson, member of PEAK, also a business owner on Main Street and property owner on Main Street. And, um, I was not on the subcommittee, but I got to learn a lot about um, this proposal and the process. And um, I would just like to say that um, this is a great opportunity before us. I know that it would put us in a leadership situation, but um, my feelings are that there's a lot of money that's gonna come down the pike, at least from the federal government. I, we know that likely infrastructure uh, bill will be passed soon, and a lot of that is dedicated towards um, infrastructure like we're talking about and um, this would um, be a big game changer for um, our community um, it would make us the hippest historic town around um, I sat in a lot of meetings uh, at the county level where uh, AT&T were putting up uh, cell phone towers not for um, cell phone use but for internet access and uh, said a lot of communities that were debating up you know they don't want these stealth looking antennas in their neighborhood la 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 and um, that was all being funded from federal money uh, to put that in here so that they could bring internet into rural areas so I know that there's a lot of money out there and AT&T already has taken a lot of it and uh, I think it'd be wise um, for this community to take a leadership role and um, be able to be in a position to receive that money because other communities that aren't thinking about this right now are gonna wake up and say, hey, we need to get our act together so that we could uh, acquire these kind of funds that will be coming down the pike. And um, we will already be there with our hands 
you know, prepared to, to receive it because of the efforts that's being taking place up right now. So um, I'd like to encourage us to have that faith to drive this forward and to make this happen for our community. I think it will be a, a, a good thing. Uh, I wanted to say another thing right now. Uh, when we talk about the cost per month, and I know Dennis probably is in the same situation as me, but uh, it, I'll be paying about a tenth of what I pay right now uh, to have fiber, and already I'm paying an exorbitant amount of money for my um, Internet service in my building, and uh, I am constantly dealing with lag. So uh, on both accounts, self-servingly, I would like to see that for that purpose, but I also think it would be a, a great benefit just to our community in general. So thanks for hearing me out. And um, good luck with this decision. Thank you, Adam. And thank both of you again for your uh, time on PEAK. Um, bringing it back, I'm going to go ahead and open up for public comment at this time. And uh, if anybody wishes to comment on this item, please uh, go ahead and step up to the podium. Sue, I think you're the only one left in the audience that hasn't, uh, it's not, uh, it's a public. All right. Sue Rodman, resident of Placerville. Um, I do have internet at my home, and it is fiber internet, and I do pay 40 bucks a month, and it's from AT&T, but there's an awful lot of people with children who during the pandemic and everything, when we were doing homeschooling, could not have access for their children to be able to do their schoolwork. I think we better prepare for a lot more schooling outside of the classroom. And I think that you need to have broadband to have that work for, for children uh, throughout the community. And I think one of your biggest problems is going to be doing some actual community outreach. I haven't seen the city do a good job with that. And you need to get busy and do some real outreach if you're going to make people convinced that the city is where they want to do. Because most of what I have heard from people is complaints about their water and sewer bills. Not congratulations that we have great water and we have a great sewer system, but complaints about the bills. And we don't advertise how well we take care of our people, how, what the quality of water is for them, how much we are working on those systems to keep them informed so that they know, yes, it was an old system, it's an old city, and there's got to be problems, but we are working to fix those as rapidly as the tax money comes in to do it. But if we're going to introduce a new utility for that people are going to pay for on their utility bill, they need to be in favor of it. And without really good public outreach, you're not going to get that. You've got to have people enthused enough to say, yeah, I'll write a check for $3,600 to have the city bring in broadband to my house. Okay, how many people are going to do that? Well, if they don't even know about it, they are not going to be out there with their checkbook, and they aren't going to support it. You've got to put in enough public input, enough public outreach to get people behind it. That's where you get your take rate. If nobody knows about it, they aren't going to put in for the take rate. So until you've done your homework to get people involved and get people behind it and get enthusiasm, it isn't going to go. But I hope you can do a better job than I have seen in the past as far as public outreach. We've had some public meetings and uh, where we've had quite a few people come in. And those kind of went to a total halt thanks to the pandemic. We need to get those going again, and those would be a great way to get people involved to decide whether they would support the broadband idea or not. Because you have to let people know about it and gain their support. Thank you, Sue. 
All right. Seeing no other public in the in the uh, audience, we'll bring it back to the council and close public comment. Um, this is a receiving file. Um, however, I do believe that uh, we we do have <clears throat> we have we have discretion to give direction to city staff, and uh, and we can uh, kind of do that at this point. I I you know when I start when I I'm going to go ahead actually. Anybody? Okay. When I when I when I hear all the motion moving towards what seems a logical decision, and we're kind of at the same place with uh, Pioneer Energy, where it just continues to make sense, so we take another step. It continues to make sense, so we take another step, and uh, and it and we continue that process until it just doesn't make sense anymore. And and to me, so far, this this makes a lot of sense to me, and I. And um, and it, and it could be a potential real value to our community, to our kids, to the next generation um, in our community, to those to what the future looks like in terms of, uh, of internet access at home and the needs for that. And uh, I don't think that just sitting on our hands is a great idea. Um, I, I I see this as a risk. I, there's no question about it. Um, but, and I agree with Sue that the public outreach is critical. I mean, we were able to get two tax measures passed, passed with, uh, with outstanding uh, number of uh, take rate on that, 78% on one of them. And uh, we know how to do that. And uh, Mickey and I spent quite a few meetings working on this and designing and developing public outreach as, as just as a uh, grassroots effort from our community. And so I believe the city and our community can, can do that again if this pans out when we get to that point. So, Cleve, I know that you have worked very hard on bringing this forward. It's a pet project of yours or an important project of yours. And I appreciate the effort and time you have put into to making sure you, this, you keep shepherding this along. Where do you see our next step as a, as a council and as a city as well, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the time. Uh, yes, this I, I will call this a kind of a pet project of mine, but I, I believe it was you and your wife that actually introduced me to it early yes, on, it's true. To, to Jeff, if I remember right. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, I'm I'm fairly passionate about this. I, I do think it can be a, a game changer in our community, and um, I think that there, there's opportunity there. We we've talked a little bit about economic development. We've talked a little bit about the schools taking advantage of this in terms of home study and et cetera. But I I think. I think the 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 potential for other activities, uh, many of which we probably don't even realize at this point that are they're out there. Um, I think I see it being an advantage in our uh, for public safety. Um, there's advantages there that we can take it uh, help with. Um, public works in terms of utilities, uh, water and sewer utility bill, a water meter reading. I think that this could greatly enhance our ability to uh, eliminate our. our uh, the meter reading service and, and have it all automated through this process. Another place that this is extremely valuable is in healthcare. In exactly. terms I was of having, just going to say in that. In terms of having point-to-point -point HIPAA compliant yep. uh, interaction with patients as well as uh, monitoring uh, and having a home, the home idea, the home medical environment is, is uh, changing very rapidly in terms of, in terms of home health and uh, and that connection to the home connectivity yeah. to the healthcare industry through yeah. all sorts of methods. So it's it's a critical part, and I think uh, Marshall Hospital would be very interested in this as yeah. well. And, and just so you know, early on, uh, I believe, it, in fact, I think Jeff came and made the presentation early on. We did invite uh, Martin Entwistle from uh, Marshall Hospital, and, and he did express interest on behalf of Marshall that it would be a, a help to them. Again, I don't think we realize all the benefits that this will provide down the road. Um, I've always gone back and looked at uh, the, the the capacity issue of the the, the circles that, that Jeff showed on there is is what is impressive to me, and that all those services that can be provided uh, through fiber. Um, so you know th th this is a big project. It's a, a you know we're just at the tip of the iceberg, if you will, at this point. Um, and where I see we need to go is uh, is, is going to take a lot of work. Um, 
I provided some, some recommendations to you uh, just today in an email that I sent out to you, and I think that is a good place to start, um, and I'll just read those quickly. Well, one thing is, I, uh, number one, I'd recommend that you adopt this ma as our broadband master plan. Uh, by doing that, I think it, it there's more work that we'll have to do in terms of uh, the things that were talked about in terms of defining this as an essential service and officially and things like that. But that, by adopting this broadband master plan, I think it sets us down that road to start that process. The other items that I'm recommending that you consider tonight is uh, directing staff to bring back, number one would be an RFP for consulting services to manage the project. Um, to date, I've kind of tried to do that as best I can. But I don't think moving forward with everything we have going that I can do that on, on my own. Um, and, well, I shouldn't say I don't think I can. I know I can't. <laughs> so I, um, I, I think that would, would be one piece that we can start with. I think we need to direct us to come back and do more work on, on the financing models, bring back options for those for us to consider. That will be working closely with Jeff and his group on that, um, and then this uh, other consultant, whoever that is that we bring in that. And then the third part is what was brought up with Ms. Rodman, and I agree a, a thousand percent with you on this, Sue, that community engagement is critical mm -hmm. to making this work. And as was mentioned, we've already had communications with uh, Sac State and their intern program in their uh, business marketing department, and that is one possibility. The other possibility is to go to a private um, community uh, outreach, a private communications firm that could s assist us with that outreach. And it may be some combination of that. But what we'd like to do, or what I'd like to recommend we do, is go back and evaluate those options and determine what is the best route to go and then bring that back to uh, the city council to move forward with. There's a number of other things involved with this that will be part of that. For example, the financing model, we will continue to look at um, grants and loans that are available for this. As uh, Bruce mentioned, the, the loan program, guaranteed loan program that the state has approved really is an advantage to us in how we roll this out because we don't, uh, doing a loan program like that would be much simpler than, than bonding for this uh, and, and less expensive too. Um, so, so there's things like that that we'll look at. There was a program email I got just today from our lobbyist uh, on, um, you may have gotten it too, I don't know, on uh, a federal rural development program that, uh, for broadband that has just been, a grant, pro, grant low program that has just been released by the federal government. So there's all kinds of opportunities out there in that, in that realm. So we'll continue to work on those. Um, again, I think one of the most important steps right now is going to be to get the consultant services management uh, company person, whatever we want to call that, uh, that can uh, stay on top of this and keep it moving forward and, and keep all the options going. So those three things is what I think we should come back with first. Um, there are some other things that decisions that need to be made that were brought up in the in the uh, uh, broadband master plan, such as you know, type of platform we're going to use in terms of open access, et cetera. We don't need to make that decision tonight, um, but that will come back to us at some point. Um, and, and actually we'll look at a, a different RFP that will determine what that is and, and who is the provider of that open access. So with that, I'll go back to you, try to answer any questions you may have of me, and I'll rely on Jeff and Bruce to help me also if there are others. So, so one of the things I'm experiencing, especially with my meeting with Pioneer Energy, is that I think we're a little behind the curve in terms of public information. Because mm -hmm. as, as of January, we are literally switching everybody's electricity over to Pioneer. And I don't know that Pioneer has done a, a great job of, of reaching out to our community yet. Now, Granted, they have a whole education program going on, but people are already starting to talk about that and reading about it and before. And so with the, with the lack of information, people are going to fill in those, those voids. Sure. And here we are talking about it tonight and creating a, what could be a conversation, a greater conversation in the community to, to, uh, for them, an opportunity for them to fill in the voids and decide whether it's a good idea or not without the information. So I, I don't think it's too soon to at least start the, the, communi the communication to our 
public because they are going to start talking about this. Mm -hmm. And we've Great. talked about it for quite a while, so this is not a secret. Mm -hmm. And we're actually doing it in public right now, so. <laughs> um, which is part of the gig. So we need, so I think it's, this, this is important at least to be top of mind as we move through this. So um, I was thinking about just what, what I had mentioned, the, the, um, Jeff, the, about the older community, but thinking about, and I talked to Cleve about Marshall Hospital the other day, and, you know, that would be, as maybe what Sue's talking about, that would be a selling point, you know, to appeal to, the, the, to that community. Because I know they're going to say, oh, I don't need that. But if you show them that, yeah, maybe this is your future with, and if we get Marshall on board, and they, you know, and the doctors are going to say we're going to, you know, connect to this system, and and I know they're doing it now by telephone, but I think this is a little bit more, you know, a more upgrade um, that we could succeed, but we're really going to have to sell it. Yes, please, Vice Mayor. Couple, couple comments. Um, I'm really encouraged by this master plan, and I'm excited about this project. I think that, you know, I, I agree with the speakers from Peak um, and with Cleve. This is really about future proofing our economy. Um, you know, most of my friends, probably half of my friends and both my husband and I are now working from home. So it's, it's just become really common, um, you know, on top of that with the school, but also with the internet of everything and 5G needing fiber. Um, I, I completely agree that there's things that we haven't even thought about that this is going to be needed for and to be able to attract businesses and just really provide an engine for economic development. I think that this is um, really an important project. And there's a couple points on page 40 of the master plan that I thought really um, would be embraced by the community and, and for anyone listening at home they are that nobody will be forced to participate it will be opt-in voluntary taxes will not increase to finance it the ongoing operation of the network will be self-sustaining and not dependent on long-term subsidies from the city and the city may contribute to get the network started but will be completely repaid over time and I think that you know those are key messages um, that given those points and just the cost and speed I, is just a no-brainer. I don't know how you could object to it. Um, I do agree with Sue on the need for outreach and also with what you're saying, Patty, is you know we have a large population that is not working from home and uploading and downloading and uploading and downloading all day long um, like people in my generation are doing. Right. Um, so that's going to be kind of the, the main hurdle and outreach will definitely be really important. But... I, I am excited, and I think that we should move forward with it. Well, I, I agree. That's where the future's going. You know, the COVID has really proven that tele telemeetings, working from home. You know, I watch just my own family who are turning away from cable to downloading the things that they want, the music that they want. Um, the demand for downloading information is just tremendous, and it's just going to increase. And this would really put us kind of on the forefront of that rather than trying to catch up later. Um, so I'm, I'm in support of this. Yeah, I, I look at my um, bill for Internet service and... <laughs> You know, you might wondering, or every time I look at it, and I, I know I'm not getting my money's worth for, <laughs> you know, the performance, whether it's here or even, you know, at my office where I would have thought I had had better service. But I think um, even with everybody working from home, it's still not, not, not great. So I do think this is the future. Uh, it's great to actually be able to control a little bit of your future as well. Uh, as we go forward, because I mean, even with Pioneer, it's um, we're moving in that direction, I think. Uh, but even that, we're you know we're still beholden to PG&E because of you know the transmission lines. But in this case, we would be the trans, we would have those transmission lines, and we would control our destiny from that point. And I can tell you that there was furious lobbying going on at the Capitol by AT&T in the final um, budget hearings because of that very reason. Uh, and and the language that ultimately ended up in the in, in the trailer bill language, uh, which really empowered municipalities versus 
um, you know, uh, investor-owned utilities. And so it's a big, I mean, it's a big game changer for their business model, uh, for them to be clients as opposed to us being their, um, their clients. So I, I do think that's a, a great uh, paradigm shift for our uh, residents and really uh, being, able, being able to provide, hopefully, a, a lot better rates and uh, much more. Because, I mean, here's the other thing, too, is so I know Patty and I have generators, but even if our generators kick on, our Comcast still doesn't come on. I mean, we're still we're out. Well, I don't have Comcast. Oh, there you go. Well, I have I have Comcast. <laughs> uh, but but my generator will not power my a lot. Of it, yeah. It's, yeah. No. So you're you're still so even if I got my lights on, I still I still don't have connectivity. I'm I'm are you, you know. Are you saying we'd have internet without power if you went this way? Well, the, be, if you have a generator, if you have. <laughs> Well, potentially, well, and, well, and, and we you don't have solar. We don't have yeah, Comcast. we'd have some solar backups. Different things that we can do into the future that I could see would be, you know, much more, yeah, much more <laughs> beneficial to to our our businesses and others. So, I think there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, I think if you're going to be in front of the line uh, with the state with the six billion that was in this last budget, and then and they've talked about a hundred billion from the feds. I think that'll go down because of the. All of the uh, you know whatever mansion and cinema ultimately want at the Senate level, but there's still going to be probably tens of billions of dollars in in broadband uh, monies that get allocated out to the states. So a lot of funding out there in addition to the SB 156 that was mentioned, uh, and I just think being in front of the line, probably with not a lot of investment on our part, but with a good plan, can really spring us forward. Um, you know, as a city. So this is great. It is going to take an investment on our side, so you know we're going to have to. Well, it's going it to be a commitment, back. that's for sure. Well, we'll so I don't know that our initial investment would get paid back, would it? Uh, of hiring a project manager and those types of things. Well, depending on how we do it, it, it could be. Um, that'll be something we'll have to determine on on how we set it up and and how we move forward. Okay. Um, but it could be. Could be. So, All right. Yeah. All right, so if we, uh, can, can we get a, I, I'd like to get a motion to to instruct uh, Cleve. I'll, I'll make a motion that we adopt the broadband master plan uh, for the city of Placerville and direct staff to bring back the following. Um, an RFP for consultant services to manage the project, preferred financing models, and community engagement process. Details. I'll second it. All right. Uh, any further discussion on this? I prefer grants for the financing, just for the brother. <laughs> <laughs> and for that, you know, this that's on this form here, so that you, we, it's all it's all right there. Um, thank you. Let's get a let's get a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Borelli, aye. Councilmember No, aye. Councilmember Saragossa, aye. Vice Mayor Taylor, aye. Mayor Thomas, aye. And I want to thank uh, Jeff and Bruce for taking your time out. There was a gentleman here that's uh, observing but is not uh, didn't necessarily speak. So thank you for coming. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Adam and Mickey, thank you for taking the time out of your evening to come and share your thoughts on this. And and again, I'm going to say for the third time, thank you for your work. I know it's uh, I know it's a very meaningful to our community that what you're putting in there. So thank you. With, yep, with, yes, let's go ahead and take a five-minute break. Right, thank you. Maybe seven. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's bring some order back to this meeting. And uh, that was five minutes, right? Okay, on to item number 12.2, authorize the mayor to sign a letter recommending alternative one, city-based alternative, to the Colorado County Board of Supervisors, Mr. Morris. Uh, I'm going to make this short, Mayor, unless you have more questions. But at your last meeting, um, you directed me to come back with a letter to send to the Board of Supervisors from signed by the Mayor um, regarding our preferred alternative, which uh, we're identifying now as Alternative 1, I guess, or the City Preferred Alternative. It's my understanding that the County held a meeting, Board of Supervisors, and kind of directed staff to work with Option 1, Alternative 1, with maybe some minor tweaks to that to, to make the numbers work. And uh, so I think that's kind of the direction they're moving, but the decision, final decision, has not been made yet. So with that, there's a draft letter. Um, I'm welcome 
I welcome any edits you may want to that uh, that's in your agenda packet. And uh, if uh, council adopts that, we'll get that off to the council or to the board as soon as possible. Thank you. All right. Any comments initially? Um, no, I, 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 uh, I, I'm fine with the letter. I think we, we should do that. I just wanted to, and I, I showed, I showed Dennis here a, a little while ago. But this is so. These are the. And nobody can see this, but these are the visualizations from the, the congressional districts that just came out. Well, our district, it's this sort of pink one in here. Um, it goes all the way down into the Tehachapi's um, into Kern County, which would be Kevin McCarthy's uh, congressional district, all the way up through all of the, kind of all the foothill districts. So Placer, looks like, you know, Alpine, some of these other ones as it goes up through here. So yeah. talk about not communi communities of interest, aside from, you know, this grouping maybe up through here. Uh, I think it just underscores the importance wow. of us having a map locally yeah. that really does fit. And whether or not, this may not be the last iteration from the... Um, the state redistricting committee, but this is the latest visualization that they rolled out, and it's probably going to be pretty close to this. Wow, well, that's so oh my god! You can see it goes all—I mean, literally, it's Kern County up through all the all the foothills, so Inyo, Mono, probably parts of that, and then into you know El Dorado and other counties. Will you show Jackie so she? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just yeah, you know, I'll use that as to underscore the importance of I think really keeping communities of. Of communities of interest together uh, here locally and, and trying to stay really as close to the to the I think the lines that we have today which I think that that first um, model does okay so thank and, you and I, and I thought you caught you capture the essence of our meeting so thank should you. we write another letter yeah I was <laughs> I was just gonna say I think, I think um, this is a, <laughs> we, we may but yeah you know, I'll, I'll get, well, that one's not on the agenda tonight. That, so. that is true. I'll but, bring back information. But All you right. know what? We've been getting emails asking us to participate, and I don't know if we are doing it, and maybe we should uh, put a little more effort. Okay. We can bring that up okay. at future agenda items. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open this up for public comment. Good evening, Sue. As your last and only public still here, um, I thought that one was the best of the alternatives that they had to, and I hope they do a little better job with it because I think that Pollock Pines doesn't really belong to South Lake Tahoe, and certainly Camino doesn't, and those definitely come more in line with Placerville and Diamond, to take off Diamond Springs and El Dorado and send them somewhere else was crazy. So I thought one came as close as it could come, but I thought they should take it up to Pollock Pines and put Pollock Pines along with Placerville because we have more people who come from Pollock Pines to Placerville than go from Pollock Pines to South Lake Tahoe. That all flows, that all flows, down. That all flows downhill. <laughs> Kids in Pollock Pines go yes. to school here. Mm -hmm, yeah. All right, thank you very much. And we'll bring it back. We'll go ahead and close, close public comment at this time. Bring it back for any discussion or a motion, please. I'll, I'll make a motion to that we um, uh, authorize the mayor to send uh, the letter to the board of supervisors. Second. second. All right, first and second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? All right. Thank you. I'm sorry, can we do a roll call vote on that? Why do we have to do a roll call vote on that? Um, any item that is um, that we're taking action on, mm -hmm. the Brown Act was amended about two or so years ago that requires a roll call so that folks who are listening in or watching are apprised exactly of how the vote goes. What for heaven's sake? We always heard it was just anything involving money. That was resolutions prior, um, and so even before this, um, a lot of folks would do consent this way, but mm -hmm. but now it has to be. Oh, wow. Good well, to know. thank you very much. Sorry, Regina. <laughs> Roll call vote, please. No problem. Council Member Burley? Aye. Council Member No? Aye. Council Member Saragossa? Aye. Vice Mayor Taylor? Aye. Mayor Thomas? Aye. All right. Now we're moving on. All right. Item number 12.3 Adopt a resolution approving hiring of a temporary administrative secretary position in the Department Development. Department of Development Services and Mr. Morris. 
Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, recently, over the last uh, few months, uh, we have listed several items on your future agenda items when you see it on your agenda. Uh, many of those have pertained to our Development Services Department, and uh, you've probably noticed that uh, they continue to be on that future agenda items and, and never end up on the agenda. Uh, recently, I met with our Development Services Director, Pierre Rivas, to discuss that issue and how we can kind of bring some of those forward because some of those have been priorities for you that you have expressed interest in seeing those come forward. Uh, so what I did is we, we went through and looked at the items that are there and, and in the end after I talked to Pierre I said uh, what can we do to um, I guess release the, the backlog and bring some of these forward and his answer to me was the potential to hire uh, the administrative secretary position that we discussed during budget time but determined that there wasn't funding for it at that time but that we would consider reconsider at mid-year. So what I'm recommending uh, tonight after reviewing this with Pierre is that you authorize a, the hiring of a temporary administrative uh, secretary for the Development Services Department. Um, and I'm recommending three months. Uh, that could change it based on various things, but up to three months. Uh, that this would uh, be hired to help out in that department um, and uh, thereby allowing Pierre to move forward with some of these items that we've been waiting for to, to bring forward. Um, the cost for that is estimated right now at $10,300. Um, it, uh, it's probably a little bit less than that. I, I had to do this while Dave Warren was on vacation, so I, I, I kind of fudged the numbers to make him to, to see what they were going to be. So I didn't have his input, but he has later told me that at least I'm safe. It's not more than that. So, <laughs> um, so what we're requesting uh, tonight is that you adopt a resolution approving the position. Um, the failure that I the, that I realized I failed to do tonight. I had a new resolution that Dave worked on with me, and I failed to bring that for you tonight, but. The, the addition that we want to add to this resolution is to actually allocate the funding, the $10,300 from the general fund uh, reserve. Is that the correct terminology, Dave? Just the general fund. Just the general fund. Yes. So it's the current year general fund, uh, we have we have a, uh, a surplus. A $16,000 surplus right. that would come from. So it would come from that current year for surplus. So we would add, add an additional whereas, an additional now therefore, to allocate that <coughs> funding of $10,300. Um, so if you can adopt the resolution with that amendment, it would be appreciated. And I apologize. I, Dave did it for me. I had it on my desk, and I forgot to bring it with me tonight. So. I can answer any questions, or also yeah. Pierre, from his perspective, from the departments here to answer questions. So. Okay. Would this be a re like a retired and annuitant, or would it just be like a a consultant type uh, or? I well, or? F fortunately, <laughs> we recently had a recruitment in the um, community services department for an administrative secretary. Um, the day before that uh, recruitment, before that interviews for that position, Pierre and I were were talking. And I knew those interviews were coming up, but I said, Pierre, why don't you sit in on these interviews and see if there perhaps is someone from that that would work. And fortunately there was. He was, I'll let him speak to that if you want, but I believe he was very excited of what the potential of a person that is interested that could fill that position. So no, it's not a retired annuitant. This is someone that uh, came through this recruitment process that we would uh, hire as a result of that. And if this potentially becomes permanent in the future that this person is interested in and would work out. So that's what we're looking at to fill the position. Are the recruitments done so it could start almost immediately, which is what we really want once you uh, approve it. So. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't Pierre, if you want to add anything else. That's, I mean, I answered my question. But. All right. Thank you. Yes. So um, the, the person doesn't necessarily have to be as qualified, like, to, to work on. This would relieve Pierre who needs all his knowledge to do the right what what's happening currently is because of the workload in the department um, at times due to some uh, an employee being out or whatever 
Pierre is the one that's getting called out to, on to actually come out and do something like issue a permit, where mm. that's not what he should be doing. And they're pretty simple tasks, and the, uh, this person can be taught to do that. I'm talking about things like issuing a permit for a water heater replacement or a roofing that are pretty simple, a re-roof. They're pretty simple uh, tasks. And there's other things, just, you know, scheduling with the, with the, for inspections and et cetera with the, uh, those, the public that come in and, and that. And so Pierre's being pulled a, away from doing these essential tasks that we want him to do to uh, take care of those functions that he doesn't have staffing to do in his department. So, And this is also, um, I'd say, it has a lot to do with unfunded state mandates and, and requirements that have been put upon you and your department that uh, are otherwise... Well, you you may have time to do other things in our uh, would that be correct yes mayor if I could add to that um, uh, you may not be aware but um, in 20 in early 2020 when we had the covid uh, shutdowns essentially the uh, parks and rec uh, department was curtailed or we we didn't really have a recreational department so um, uh, Terry was kind enough to loan us um, a administrative secretary that was working in our department, and that was to relieve our, at the time, our current administrative secretary. And and if you recall, the staff had come to you, and you you agreed to basically create a new position of development technician. So our previous administ administrative secretary is now in a development technician pos position doing much more work as far as assisting me in research and as you stated the uh, state mandates a lot of new um, senate bills and assembly bills have been passed and they're they're feverishly coming in and we have to react to those and they change not only what we do in the planning division but they affect what we do in the building division and so yes it's going to help me significantly because we're we have a skeleton crew if you will so you know we have a we're a very very busy office we see a lot of the public um, you know our counter is very very busy and so we can't shut it down uh, somebody has to be there and things happen with other staff and so a lot of times I find myself as Mr. Morris pointed out I'm issuing the building permits and doing things because we have to serve the customer we can't turn them away um, and so it's going to help me but it's also going to uh, fill that administrative uh, secretary position that sort of we don't really have somebody doing that we're getting further and further behind on reporting we, we do a lot of reports to the state there's a lot of fees that we collect on behalf of the state and a lot of different things we got to do once budget comes up and so you know we got to track a lot of things so there's a there's just a, a whole variety of of high level secretarial work that needs to get done that we're getting very behind on so this is extremely important to us all right thank you with that i'll go ahead and open up public comment at this time, anybody wishing to, any no. person wishing to <laughs> comment on this publicly? Okay. We'll go ahead and bring it back to the council for further discussion. Um, I'd any? like to make a motion. All right. That we adopt the resolution approving the hiring of temporary administrative secretary position in the Department of Development Services and add what you recommend. That, we <laughs> that works. <laughs> I'll That's second. 2003. Okay. Um, Wow. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead with roll call vote, please. Councilmember Varelli? Aye. Councilmember No? Aye. Councilmember Saragossa? Aye. Vice Mayor Taylor? Aye. Mayor Thomas? Aye. Thank you, Regina. Okay, on item 12.4, approve a 25% reduction in site plan review planning application fee for the proposed Placerville Hotel, a.k.a. Gateway Hotel, a.k.a. something else before that. Um, <laughs> Mr. Rivas. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, fairly simple request. Um, I think most of it is, is explained there in the staff report, particularly on page 2 where we outlined the justification for you why we feel that it would be appropriate to reduce the site plan review application fee by 25%. So if you look on the first page, we, we, we sort of outline how that fee is determined. It's a fixed fee. So for those projects that are under $100,000, it's a $500 fee. For projects that are $100,000 to $400,000, 
it's $500 plus 0.8% of the value that's over $100,000. And then we have a third tier for those projects with a valuation of over 400000 and up. So we would charge them $2,900 plus 0.6% of the value over $400,000. So when we looked at this project, and again, we're trying, we're trying desperately to facilitate and timely fanner to get this uh, project uh, through, through the system, you know, COVID hit and it extremely added cost to the project significantly, as we've all heard. I guess wood now has come down quite a bit back to where it was pre-COVID levels, but a lot of construction costs, labor costs are very, very high. So we looked at, for example, the last hotel that was approved that went through the whole process was the Hampton Inn, and they, they paid a site plan review fee of $5,200. And they had a valuation for their $52,000, right? $52,000, <laughs> excuse me. So $52,000 was their site plan review. The hotel had a valuation of $9 million. This hotel, uh, the what, what we're calling the Placerville Hotel, but it's as known as the, uh, the Gateway Hotel. Um, and this being, I think this is now the seventh hotel that has gone through the process since back in the 1980s for this site. And so for those reasons, we bulleted this, you know, this hotel has a valuation of $16 million. So when you calculate that out, their fee is going to be almost $100,000. So we felt maybe that was a, a tad excessive. Uh, but again, considering uh, that both for the Hampton Inn, we have some of the same investors on that, uh, that hotel were the same investors for this hotel. We did considerable amount of staff work, significant amount of staff work uh, with, without any payment at all. So we think we're going to recoup some of that through this fee. But still, to make it equitable and fair, we felt that because this project is going to utilize the existing uh, foundations, so the foundation that we've seen out there for years that was originally built, uh, for the Holiday Inn Express, they're going to be able to utilize that. So that's a reduction in cost there. Um, plus, I think we've gone through this process so many times, I think it, it assists staff on having a number of templates to which to use so we're not starting from scratch. So that's another significant cost savings. So, so with that, unless the council has any questions, this is just a request. We think it's fair and equitable. Uh, we're still going to get, it's still a pretty high fee. Um, you know, we're still going to collect um, a fair amount, much more than we charged for the Hampton Inn. But we feel that 25% reduction is is fair and e equitable for all parties. Happy to answer any questions you have. <laughs> no, I, I don't really have a question. Um, I, I'm I'm in agreement with you know doing the the 25%. Uh, you know, decrease. I think it's a great project um, coming to the city. Something that's sorely needed on our seventh try <laughs> uh, over thirty over a thirty-year period, or at least twenty-year period. Um, the only thing I, I would say, and, and maybe this is for a, a future meeting, though, is that I'd love to see somebody from the project actually be here um, to talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, we are. You know, not just because we're giving them a, potentially giving them a reduction in fees, but just so the public has a better understanding of it and you know kind of builds that community support early. Uh, so I think whenever we can have them in, even if it's just um, for a five to ten minute update on the project, at some point it would be good. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I appreciate what you have done here. I think it's absolutely critical that. As a, as a government, as you know, for the people, we're not overcharging them, and we're not um, we're here to serve them, and they're here to cover our costs. But we're generally not here to make money off of uh, the, the, the citizens and those people willing to invest in our community like this. But I do feel it's appropriate that they cover their cost and cover the expense in our community as well, and uh, which is all those fees that we charge all over the place and. And so I, I think it's extremely important that we honor that, um, honor that here. And I appreciate you taking, you know, looking at this and making sure that it is, it's the right fit for this investment and in that area. So thank you for doing that. All I right. think I think I think Pierre's done a great job in, um, you know figuring out the past money received mm -hmm. and you know he's kind of balanced it's it's penciled out mm -hmm. in other words 
and I, I, I certainly am. Um, we just, I hope this one works. <laughs> we, we've waited a long, long time. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and open it up for public comment. Oh, we have a winner. Thanks, Sue. This is at least the third hotel that I've heard of going in this same area. And so it seems to me that with the work that's already been done, this is an appropriate thing. I think Pierre has done a good job. Good, good job, Pierre. So, and let's do hope we finally get our hotel. Huh? Fingers crossed. Thank you, Sue. All right, I'll go ahead and close public comment, bring it back for uh, any further discussion or a motion, please. I'll move that we approve the 25% reduction in site plan review. I'll second it. All right, roll call vote, please. Council Member Borelli? Aye. Council Member Nell? Aye. Council Member Saragossa? Aye. Vice Mayor Taylor? Aye. Mayor Thomas? Aye. All right, I've done pretty good. I haven't lost my agenda tonight. All right, moving on to item number 13. Council reports from other agency meetings. Eldorado County Transit, we haven't had a meeting. We actually did, but did it was a closed session and I can't talk about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we had an extra meeting. <laughs> All right. Stand corrected. Although I can't know about it. Transportation, okay. we didn't have. Okay, nothing there. LAFCO? Tomorrow. All right. Tomorrow. All right, thank you. And then uh, SACOG. We did have a meeting, a uh, large discussion in regards to sort of the future in what I would call mass transit, whether it be buses or anything else, as we have to um, sort of reduce our mileage as the state moves to the vehicle miles traveled um, uh, criteria. And really, the, the, they had a, we had some experts in from different areas, but the one thing that really stood out was, so if you take a bus and they, you know, I forget, I think it was like 13 miles. But if you take a bus today, 13 miles, it's 60 minutes to get to wherever you're going. If you take a single occupancy car, it's 16 minutes. So until that number, 16 to 60, you know, can get somewhat uh, into an area where they're somewhat competitive, uh, it's going to be a real challenge, you know, as, as we move forward uh, to do things. So there was, there was a lot of talk about that and just sort of the, um, you know, what does 20 years look like for our freeways, you know, with uh, – remote you know, or driverless vehicles you know a lot of things are going to change uh, tremendously in actually a pretty short period of time so it was a, a healthy discussion uh, along those lines and then on pioneer we had a couple of presentations and i don't remember them so they mustn't have been that important <laughs> sorry I, I have a question for you on say, say cog <laughs> At least he's honest yeah. <laughs> uh, i have a question for you on say cog in yes. terms of there was there was some question about, um, if I recall correctly, this idea of equity and people living up in the yeah. foothills opposed to the city. Yes, yeah. so and how there's they're going to charge VMTs and correct. So there's yeah there's a, so we have a our REI committee, race equity and inclusion committee, and there's really there's a, a movement not at the state and at the federal level to have that that REI component whenever you're looking at major transportation projects now and how it affects quote unquote underserved areas and um, you know our supervisor supervisor Thomas director Thomas at the time did bring up the point uh, that you know as we look at other areas it, you know the reality is you know El Dorado County is not as um, you know our eth ethnic breakdown is you know more Caucasian and so how do you get there I mean so it's not the same difference as you're looking at a much you know, more diverse area like the city of Sacramento and so we really underscored the fact and it wasn't just you know El Dorado County but in other rural areas is how we still are able to meet those gui guidelines and criteria so that underserved just doesn't necessarily mean like communities of color but it also means rural areas so that there is a uh, a way for us to meet those goals still. And SACOG was committed to understanding that so that our, you know, what it may be for Sacramento or Elk Grove is going to be a little bit different when it comes to Lincoln or, or not even so much Lincoln, but maybe Loomis or mm -hmm. Placerville. So that definitely northern, was. Northern counties or. Correct. So, but we're at, well, there's a real risk of us being disadvantaged 
in this whole VMD, VMT VMT. calculations. A absolutely. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, anyone that lives that's not in a, in a city center is going to be disadvantaged. You know, when you're not in a big city um, and you don't have, you know, and you got to drive 20, 30, 40 miles right. to get where you're going to go. Um, and so as a SACOG region, we're going to be trying to provide equity within that framework. You know, and now whether the state and, and feds go along with that is going to be a whole other I issue as we drive forward. But as a region, I think we're going to be pushing forward with that goal of, of provide, ensuring that, well, not ensuring, but at least pushing that there's equity because, you know, ultimately the fate will, may not be up to us, but, you know, what the, it's the same what state old dictates. story. Yeah. Everything. We're always, we're this little rural, you know, community up here, and it's the big guys get the, Price. Yeah, I mean the, the good thing on the, at least for SACOG is, you know, the, the little guys. At least there's, there's more of us than there are of. There are, yeah, and, and and it's nice to have that representation. We didn't have it, you know, before, but still they they carry a lot of weight. Yeah. And there's that weighted vote and everything because of, of land and population right. wise, but uh, but I think there there would be enough. I mean. It, if we couldn't come to an agreement, it would be a really detrimental to the future of SACOG. I'll say. Um, Michael, question for you. You brought up an interesting point in terms of transit with, you know, public transportation taking 16 minutes versus 60 mm -hmm. minutes to go 13 miles. You know, and we're at, at El Dorado Transit and transit facilities all over the place. They are looking at going to zero emission buses, which is an enormous expense. Um, and it almost seems like the trend towards public transportation might be Dwindling. going in different direction directions altogether you yeah know, is that, did you so talk we, about we that? did talk about that and i think in a lot of the, the directors i think realize this is that we're really going to have to reimagine what public transit looks like you know is it going to be more micro transit right. type uh, of of um you know infrastructure you know smaller you know even if via even cars uh, versus, you know, a, a bus system or, or something a, else. a lot easier to get zero emission cars. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I mean, it's a hugely expensive, you know, amount. And, you know, I, I, I brought up, and I know I've brought it up here, is I, I use, you know, the commuter buses every now and then mm -hmm. to go to my office in Sacramento. And what was always pretty much a full bus, um, you know, the most I've had since you know, the last 18 months is about six people. Yeah. And so it's, it's... There's a lot um, of work from and, home now going on. And I think it was, what, nine rides down the hill? I think it's four now. Right. Four. Um, and so we've, I mean, it's been more than cut in half, even the the routes that are on there. So, yeah, it's going to... That was a gonna, big part of our finance uh, that our, for the for transit was I, that, the, the that modeling, commuter ride, ride. The modeling showing that <clears throat> it's going to, that it'll change. I, I have my own doubts because I think Sacramento is such a... A government worker driven city that it's not like other areas that have more diverse economies to drive population and people right. back into transit and so if wor government workers never go back to the office in the same fashion you know will a mass transit product really work the way we, yeah. we, we need it to so right. yeah those are all questions that still have to be answered which is why it's so important to have one representation on say call and be <clears throat> instead of being on the menu we're at the table mm -hmm. Agreed. And that's always been the argument of SACOG. And there's been, there's over the years, there's been uh, uh, movement of people not to be on, um, for for us not to participate in that program. But uh, clearly there is. So moving on, request for uh, Plasterville Safety Council, actually. Was there anything to add there? I don't. All right, moving on. Request for future agenda items. I believe that we, do you remember what it was? Should we write another letter? About I think we should write another letter. Districts? I, we, yeah. I think we should have a conversation about whether we want to write another letter. Okay. Um, then and I, then potentially see. from that have a, because we Michael don't even know, because yeah. we do need to have the conversation. Yes. I'll bring Wait. more information back from the redistricting committee. Do you know what the timeline is for? Uh, it's like mid-November. Um, that they're. So our next meeting possibly might be there. I'll, um, at the very least, I'll let Cleve and the mayor know um, information if we need to get something out sooner than our next okay. Uh, meeting. Okay. All right, city manager and staff reports. Oh, I had a, I did have a too request late. for oh, too, too, too late. late. Too late. 
<laughs> All right, go ahead. Um, I've just I've gotten a couple of uh, constituent emails in regards to, and I know it was on our well when we uh, for the uh, develop, development developmental development services uh, department um, in terms of short term rentals um, and <laughs> wanting to meet. Um, just to, to give input into it. So I don't know if that has to be a special meeting, but uh, I think there's uh, a lot of interest out there for folks to give input on what SR short-term rentals would look like prior to whatever we roll out something. So um, I don't know if that can just be a future agenda item or something, but I think, I think people want to be able to give some input prior to us rolling out whatever something may look like. Yeah, I got that email also, and I talked to Pierre about that. What I suggested to him, what I heard, is that perhaps that forum could be the planning commission. However, not to, you know, what they were saying, as you mentioned, don't, don't tell us what you're going to do and then ask us to comment. And so I suggested to Pierre that perhaps it takes two planning commission meetings. The first one is simply, you know, here's the issues. Now, public, you know, let us hear what you want to say. And then they can come back with a recommendation to the Planning Commission for what the short-term rental would be. And then from there, it would come to the City Council. So if that's acceptable, I think that's a doable process on, on I think good for staff, staff time and everything involved, uh, as opposed to having a, a special meeting or a public meeting of some kind, would, that would be a great way to uh, accommodate their desire to have input. Right. Sure. That works. Yeah, that sounds great. Pierre, Pierre, I think that's acceptable to you. We do that, that way. We discussed it, I know. Yeah. Okay. Do, do we actually have a, a rough draft that could be presented prior to that time? Well, I think what they're requesting is that we don't yeah. throw out a well, rough draft. Well, I mean, draft. if we have one, we have one. I mean, we're just that's not going to hide it from them and then, sure. and then <laughs> drop and it. Then, but <laughs> if we don't have one, that's perfectly fine, too. Then they can. But it seems like you'd have to have some kind of framework for the conversation. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, particular bullet points. And we do. Concern. We have a very, very, I would say, a rough, rough draft. Okay. Because, you know, essentially with the new state laws uh, where the ADUs are now required by right. In fact, mm -hmm. there were, first you're allowed one ADU and then you're allowed a junior ADU. ADU and I think now it looks like we're going to allow uh, the... Um, subdivision through parcel map of a single family residential zone that can allow up to four units on each created parcel. So we have to ask ourselves, all of these measures are being done to create affordable housing. State law requires that based on the size, um, if you're, I think 750 square feet is a cutoff. If you're below 100 square, 750 square feet, you pay no impact fees. That is what the state is mandating all jurisdictions to do in the state for affordable housing, not for lodging. And I emphasize that. I think that's very important to me personally, being in this career for as long as I have. And all of the effort we're going through, uh, we just finished adopting our housing element. We have a very, very severe housing shortage in Placerville. Rents are skyrocketing. Home, single family homes are not available for people to purchase. And we're seeing more and more of illegal conversion and construction of ADUs because of this, because the market is driving investment to come in and commoditize our single family homes. I'll leave it with that. I'm happy to do the uh, workshop with the Planning Commission, but this is where the rubber is going to meet the road. Okay. <laughs> well, that makes sense, and all the more reason to have funded that position with all the work that's coming your way with SB 9 and 10 and we don't even exactly know what the you know outcomes of those things are going to be yet to to our communities although it does also bring up the fact that we might want to look at historical districts even more so because that is a caveat under the SB 9 or 10 either one of those to to potentially make it harder to right. do some of that stuff by right, right. so thank you uh, Pierre and and I look forward to seeing how that goes um, so I'm not sure how far down this rabbit hole I can go, but I'm going to keep going until somebody yells at me. Um, <laughs> okay, you, I got you. I got you listening now, huh? Is this a future agenda item you're discussing? It, it could be. Um, how you know? One of the things we just talked about is the how much input the public has. 
sometimes it comes all the way up to to these seats and we end up going eh, i just don't see that and we disagree where at what point do we have the opportunity or should we have the opportunity to have input to help guide this process a little bit well that's a that's a difficult one because like i say with this one is something that by our ordinance has to go through the planning commission mm -hmm. um and and they make a recommendation under that review um yeah that's a tough one yeah i think sometimes when there are either controversial or high interest topics that um ordinarily do go to the planning commission first but which for which the council also wishes to provide direction we could have joint meetings um where the planning commission can also have the benefit of hearing global policy decisions um, that the council establishes after also obtaining stakeholder and stakeholder input or public input and then formulating ordinances or resolutions that follow in line with those global policies thank you so i i mean perhaps that workshop we just talked about with planning commission mm -hmm. should be a joint meeting it could be at least for that portion of the meeting it could be joint yeah um, i don't know are you all interested in or providing input for this issue or you want to just go ahead and let it run the course through planning commission I mean, we have a process my question to you is why are we bumping the process <clears throat> it's 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 a different process it's not a bad process it's an option and so i don't look at it as a good or bad uh, i don't think we're bumping it i think that I think that if we feel that there's a need for our input, because if it gets to us and we go, we don't like that, I don't want to go. I've, I've seen it go through all the work through planning, and it gets yeah. up to here, and Keeps it doesn't. It, it, could, it could be more efficient mm -hmm. to be able to provide direction at the beginning and I think there's a lot of people well maybe not a lot maybe it's the same person keeps contacting all of us but <laughs> I think there's and there's people that want to do it you know they're mm -hmm. hanging out there and we keep saying you know we'll do it we'll do it we'll do it and we haven't and it's been quite a while and the big question is is do we want to provide that level of input and I'm contemplating that because I my mind just goes spinning as soon as this comes up and I I don't know it's well, not a matter of trust it's a matter of whether we just want to have a broader like you said global conversation about it or um, not and what Pierre just shared with us it's kind of changing the dynamics mm -hmm. uh, that we might you know well perhaps what we will do is uh, we'll schedule this as a discussion at your November 9th meeting to hold a joint meeting with the Planning Commission and you can make that determination at that point for a for a workshop is this delaying so, the Planning Commission schedule on this though because I don't want to hold it up I, I don't think so no I think uh, another alternative is if the council wants to to independently think of some global policy to, uh, decisions without holding a joint meeting it can and it can direct the planning commission we would like you to consider um, an ordinance that has the following features mm -hmm. and that way they have some guidance so we're not ping-ponging back between the two bodies so we can either take a, a portion of our meeting and provide some of that guidance or we can do it in person at one of their meetings where we just take a portion of their meeting and and have that same thing either way i i appreciate the, those inputs because i think either way works for me same, same. um <laughs> is there is, is there a, a preference 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 yeah, I was just, uh, this won't be your next meeting is november 2nd is that the one that got canceled i saw something come through our next meeting is november the 16th and we're trying to get the hotel on that agenda right. item that's all i'm going to work on yeah so if if we brought this back to you as an agenda item item on november 9th to consider how you want to do it you have that option either we could probably write that staff report in a way that you can either at, at that meeting provide those general policy statements you would like to see in the ordinance or you can elect to hold a joint meeting with the planning commission um, so um in this you know what is your timing realistic timing for this because it sounds like you have i don't you know we already realize that there's additional pressures in your department and and things you have going so where does this fit in with your um with your calendar and schedule for this because this we don't need to do this in november I mean, we can do this in January or February, depending on your schedule and how it works. I don't see, I don't feel that there's a real sense of urgency. It's, I think it's important. 
and I'll be frank, my recommendation is you, you punt it until January at a minimum. Okay. You have to understand we have our city planner is retiring. Mm -hmm. And our recruitment isn't going as well as we had hoped. Gotcha. So, uh, yes, and I agree. And, I, you know, like I said, we need to fit okay. it within your scheduling. So, so we'll bring this back in a January meeting and, and evaluate uh, where you're at in the process and, and go from there. Sounds good. Thank All right, you, thank you. Okay. All right, any more uh, items for future agenda? Yes, no, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, all right upcoming items are in the agenda you can see it online mayor, mayor can i city manager uh, oh city i manager. know there's yes. none listed there i just want to mention a couple things reminder our yes. government work governing workshop tomorrow starts at 9 30 <laughs> here in this room uh so <laughs> ho hopefully you all have that on your calendar yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so looking forward to that um and then the, I just want to mention quickly, um, green means go. I know Michael's been very involved. There's a, a meeting, a uh, SACOG meeting on Thursday that I'm participating in to learn more about how they're going to move forward with green means go. I remember, know they got some funding from the state. I forget what the dollars were, uh, Michael. $38 million. $38 million. Um, So some. not looking. Well, I think the request was five hundred, so thirty-eight hundred. Oh, yeah. oh, it was a hundred. Okay, it was a hundred million. They got thirty-eight. We did, we did all right. Okay. So they, it, it will help, and and we are in their Green Mingos area. We we have areas in that that are, are part of the program. So uh, hopefully, we report back and see what the potential is for something. Uh, and the like county that. turned that down. Any of it? They did. Yeah. You know, it's interesting on the map that you look at. The county shows potential areas that have not been approved. I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, so maybe they're reconsidering. So I don't the know. No, they, no, they, sh they shot it down. The, we selected areas for this one because it's along those same lines of, of, of housing is primarily what it is. It's, we selected the Broadway corridor again um, for this, and, and it'll fit, I think it will fit well if we do the Civic Lab program to identify how those can work. Hopefully, this brings some funding in that could actually implement some of that. So, to get it started. All right. So. Thank you. Was that it, Cleve? Yeah. All right. So, we're going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting at eight oh five. Thank you very much for coming. We look forward to seeing you on our next at our next meeting. I don't know when. Tomorrow. Oh yes, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>